So good morning and welcome to the sixth annual conference of the European Society for Periodical Research. It is a great pleasure to me to introduce this welcome address and it is just wonderful to see you all here at Ulm. Uh, about this time last year, I was attending the fifth annual conference of Esprit at the University of Liverpool. Uh, the conference on periodical countercultures, tradition, conformity and dissent, brilliantly organized by Brian Maidman and Matthew Philpots. And little I hoped then that we would be hosting the next annual conference. So this came to us as a big honor and also as a big challenge, I must say, given the quality expected from his free conferences. So, uh, first of all, I should bring uh, the greetings from our Chancellor, Professor Mario Negri, and our Vice-Chancellor, <laughs> Professor Angelo Turco, uh, who sent his apologies for not being able to be here today and give his welcome address personally, but he wishes us all the best for the conference. But we're definitely going to have the welcome address <laughs> of Paolo Giovannetti. Uh, Paolo Giovannetti is Professor of Italian Literature here at Yule. He's the, co the um, um, coordinator of our scientific committee. He's also the head of the Department of Communication and uh, the coordinator of our research group on 20th and 21st century periodicals between the avant-garde and postmodernism. So please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, 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 I want to begin uh, with uh, an idea, a general idea, because um, one year ago, uh, for us, we are the Milanese uh, group uh, of research, uh, Esprit was uh, just, uh, just a myth. Uh, um, yes, uh, we... we uh, we knew that uh, an association of uh, foreign scholars uh, was uh, uh, doing something uh, important. Uh, we had uh, to understand and study. We wanted to understand and study s some uh, problems about the periodicals. Now you have uh, accepted uh, to be our guest and to help us uh, study periodicals and their cultural implications. We can just express uh, our gratitude for your wonderful, for this wonderful opportunity. So welcome uh, to our conference. Um, I want uh, to tell you, uh, almost uh, to narrate, uh, a double historical attitude, um, anecdote, <laughs> anecdote, uh, which stresses the relationship between periodicals, conflict, and the literature. Uh, what is, uh, which is uh, very important for me. I am a, a professor of Italian uh, literature. As you, the, can, can, you s can we see the next one? As you possibly already know, in Italy, Milan is uh, something like, you are in Milan, <laughs> uh, something like a birthplace of a modern, if, if not modernist, idea and practice of uh, periodicals. Two seminal magazines, you, you may see uh, Il Caffè e Il Conciliatore, have uh, deeply influenced uh, Italian cultural history. Um, it might be interesting uh, to emphasize that both of them, let's remain, uh, okay, uh, that both of them undertook a metaphorical battle for the renewal of culture, philosophy, literature, and science, even if their titles suggest uh, the idea of a dialogue. Uh, let's, let's remain, <laughs> because we have <laughs> il caffè, il caffè means uh, coffee bar, and uh, conciliatore, something like peacemaker, uh, reconciler, so conflict, but uh, the meaning of the to uh, reviews is the opposite. The Milanese, and so we may see the next one. The, next one, <laughs> the Milanese uh, Giovanni Berchè, Giovanni Berchè was one of the editors of Conciliatore. Eh? He was a skillful uh, uh, translator from both English and German. 
Uh, in Italy, he was uh, maybe is, uh, still considered the Italian Tirteus, uh, um, that is a poet uh, who sang the importance and beauty of struggle and war. Mm? Namely, the struggle for Italian freedom against the Austrian oppression and autocracy, and for the independence uh, of the Italian nation. Mm? In 1820, Berchet was uh, compelled to abandon Italy and to live uh, as an exile in France, England, Belgium for almost 30 years. When uh, he fled uh, hurriedly from Milan, he was writing a poem, a hybrid poem influenced by the form of the, the ballad, where he wanted to praise the sacrifice of the inhabitants of Parga. Mm. Parga is a small town in Epirus in Greece. What had happened to the inhabitants of Parga? After the fall of Napoleon and the peace of Vienna, Parga was bound to become part of an area submitted to British influence. However, English government, a Tory cabinet, changed its mind. <laughs> and in uh, 1817 subscribed an agreement with a local Turk tyrant named Ali Pasha. He was uh, doomly well known for his cruelty and uh, unreliability. So Ali Pasha in 1819 was preparing to occupy Parga with uh, the permission of Great Britain. The inhabitants of Parga then, afraid of the possible slaughters, chose a collective exile. All of them abandoned their town, trying not to leave anything of their tradition in the hands of the enemy. They decided even to burn the bones of their dead ancestors and to bring the ashes away with them. The Parga crisis was a major European affair and then began, uh, and uh, had become uh, infamous uh, mainly because of the journals. In Great Britain, there was a strong debate, uh, and uh, in a Whig magazine, typically a big magazine, the Edinburgh Review, in 1819 appeared a very informed and uh, polemical essay about uh, this affair. Berchet, Milanese Berchet read the article together with other writings and decided to compose a long poem about Parga. The next, what Berchet didn't know uh, was that the article in the Edinburgh Review had been written by the most eminent Italian uh, exile, Ugo Foscolo, who had been living in England si since 1815. Uh, the next one. Uh, you may see now the image of Parga here. Uh, you may see how the Italian public opinion imagined the people of Parga leaving their homeland. This is a picture of uh, Francesco Hayez, the most important romantic Italian painter. It, it was exposed in 1831. It uh, took uh, Berchet years to end uh, his poem, which was published in Paris in 1823. I'd just like to show the next one, the prossima, uh, some lines of this uh, poem. Uh, the protagonist is an inhabitant of Parga, whose name is Arrigo, Henry, um, who, is, uh, 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 who tried uh, to commit uh, suicide and was uh, saved by an English marine. Uh, at the end of uh, the narration, the Greek man curses Harry and uh, the English people, the English, uh, because they have treated Parga. Mm. I translate. Do not cry, I do not accept uh, tears from persons I despise. You are an honorable man, but what matters? You are the son of a land which is execrable. Cars the beat, wherever people naked, desired, slaves sigh, there a cry swears the iniquitous people who sold us in so vile a trade. A double conflict, a double conflict, so to say both against the official enemy, the Turkish, 
and against and uh, against uh, the false friends, the English. About two centuries have passed since. Now I show you a magazine which should be here if I find it, but here. This is an important Italian magazine, internazionale. Um, it is not published in Milan, but in Rome. Also the author of uh, the experimental test I will speak about now, whose nom de plume is Zero Calcare, is not Milanese. Um, and is not a writer, but uh, a very gifted uh, cartoonist. Anyhow, what Zero Calcare has accomplished today uh, through a magazine and its own art is very similar to what Berchet had done two centuries ago. Zero Calcare wanted to denounce something that uh, the Western public opinion was forgetting, that is to say the battle of independent Kurdish movements, Kurdish movements and soldiers in Kobane, northern Syria, against Daesh ISIS. Not only Daesh, the enemy, is also Turkey, which cannot accept any form of autonomy of the Kurdish nation. At the beginning of uh, uh, 2015, the story of Koben, uh, Koben calling, uh, the story of Koben was not very well known after the symbolic intervention by Zero Calcare, something has changed. The graphic novel, uh, we see Zero Calcare, and let's see the, the next one, uh, the, this uh, uh, graphic novel, after the symbolic intervention of Zero Calcare, something has changed. The graphic novel is entitled Kobane Calling, Coban calling, and uh, you can see some panels of it in its English translation. Needless to say that uh, this is a hybrid to a storytelling, but also a reportage, a pamphlet, and so on. A few weeks ago, Italian journals, the next one, communicated that uh, this girl soldier, Aise, who is uh, Turkish, hmm? Uh, was a member of the Kurdish Independent Army, YPG, she, she was a, a Turk communist militant, died in battle. She had become popular just to Zero Calcare's graphic novel and, her, and therefore to the commitment of an independent magazine. So, if uh, we want to speak of conflicts in magazines today, surely we must remember that uh, despite technological revolution, some features of a periodical communication of the past may, st may still be very actual and uh, teach us something important. And this is my hope and wish that our research be capable to inspect the roots of conflicts, their permanence deriving from historical problems that uh, we daily have to face. Enjoy the conference, buon lavoro. Yes. Well, thank you, Paolo, and thank you to all the scientific committee, uh, Paola Carbone, Andrea Curato, Lisa Gaffarotto, Antonio Loreto, and Filippo Pennacchio. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now let me introduce Marianne van der Morter. Um, Marianne van der Morter, as most of us know, is professor at the, Depart at the uh, Department of Literary Studies at Ghent University. She's an expert on Victorian periodicals, with particular focus on periodical poetry and women's contribution to the periodical press. And today she's going to give a welcome address on behalf of Esprit and as the editor-in-chief of JEPS, the Journal of European Periodical Studies. Thank you, Marianne, for being here. A warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the entire Esprit board and thank you to the organizers for having us. If you've ever organized a conference, you'll know that it's really hard work and that if everything's going well, most of that work remains invisible and it's going really well and we're very grateful to be here. Um, 
So if this is your first Esprit conference, we're very happy to meet you and hope it will be the first of many. Um, if, this is, if this is your second or third time or you're starting to lose count, it's good to see you again and welcome back. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was at another conference here in Italy organized by an American society. And before the conference, we got several emails from the organizers um, reminding us that there would be speakers from 16 different countries and that we would witness a variety of presentation styles and ways to explore our field of research. And we were encouraged to seize this opportunity to enjoy our differences and learn from each other. And I kept thinking about those emails, and then I thought about Esprit, because bringing together scholars from different countries, languages, research traditions, traditions has always been at the core of our mission. Diversity is so much part of what Esprit is that we perhaps take it for granted, but we shouldn't, and our annual conference is the perfect time to remind ourselves of that. Esprit was founded in 2009 by periodical scholars from Austria, Belgium, England, the Netherlands, Sweden, Scotland, and the United States. And our earliest conferences were one-day events. It was just a bunch of scholars in a room, basically, talking about periodicals. But we've grown so much uh, over the past couple of years, and we hope to continue providing a lively forum to share and discuss periodical research. And we need you for that, all of you working on periodicals. In the past year, we've taken crucial steps to formalize as free status as a society. And this conference will have our first real business meeting. And Usha, would you like to say something about that? Usha is one of the founding mothers of Esprit. I was one of the original uh, scholars in the Netherlands. So we were, well, as we started in 2009, we went to a conference in Denmark, and two Dutch scholars, uh, one uh, is me, and two mm. scholars from the UK decided that we needed the platform to talk about periodicals in a more constructive and structured manner. So we started as pre, and uh, it's grown from being just a mailing list, basically, to us having a website and a periodical and a uh, this conference actually marks a very exciting moment for us because after all those years, we're finally able to make a formal organization of Esprit. And uh, we need your help for that. So we all would like you to come <coughs> to the business meeting tomorrow at 1.30. We need people there to help us decide how to proceed with this and to, uh, to vote on the decisions that we are making. And we'll present the board, we'll present our plans for the future. So we hope to see you there tomorrow. We'll talk about the statutes, uh, the rules and regulations involved, um, with membership issues as well. So what will you get when you become a member of Esprit? How can we continue? We'll talk about the conference next year uh, in Paris as well. So all kinds of exciting things going on for Esprit. And this is a very important conference for us because it's the birth of the formal organization. And as Marianne said, we really need you and your help for that. So we all hope to see you tomorrow during the business meeting. Thanks, Usha. Um, one final thing. Last year at the, uh, the conference in Liverpool, we launched the Journal of European Periodical Studies, and we've just published our third issue on Monday. It's online. You can all see it. Um, and in the true spirit of Esprit, it's peer-reviewed online and open access, so it's freely available to all of you. Um, I'll probably talk a bit more about the journal at the business meeting, but for now, just this. The organizers will guest edit a special issue on the conference theme. Um, so please, on behalf of the entire editorial team and our guest editors, do consider submitting your work to us. There's no journal without you, and there's no conference without you. So enjoy, and again, welcome. Does it work? Yes. And on behalf of the scientific committee, I would like to thank Matthew Philpotts from the University of Liverpool, who first brought our proposal to Esprit, and whose help has been precious in refining the theme of this conference. And uh, I would like to thank very warmly Finula Dillon from University College Dublin, 
who's constantly been in touch with us. I've literally pestered her with emails. <laughs> and uh, I, I think this conference wouldn't be happening without, without your help and constant support and advice. Thank you, Finula. And finally, I, I would like to thank all the conference delegates for their fantastic cooperation. The organization of this event has been a teamwork in the true sense of the word. Thank you all, and enjoy the conference. <laughs> Just one word about the beautiful uh, images you can see projected on the screen. Uh, they've been kindly be made available by APICE. APICE is an acronym which stands for Archivi della Parola, dell'Immagine e della Comunicazione Editoriale, Archives of the Word, of the Image, and of Editorial Communication. And uh, this center was founded by the University of Milan in 2002, with the aim to collect, preserve, and valorize archives and collections that are of vital importance for the study of modern and contemporary literature, art, and the publishing industry. And today, thanks to donations and acquisitions, the archive contains more than 50 collections. So we thank Apice for cooperating with us and making available these beautiful images of futurist magazines. Thank you. So, um, all conference sessions will be held uh, on the fifth floor. Um, I think the round table is taking place uh, on the sixth floor on Friday, but we are all, uh, we're staying on these two floors, okay, fifth floor and sixth floors, and um, coffee breaks and lunches will be served on the sixth floor in one of the two pyramids. You will definitely find which one you have to go to because one is full of chairs. And that's meant for round tables and academic things, while the other one, I, I hope you will find some food and drinks, and so you, you'll find it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you. Do I have to say anything else? No, no. Thanks. Um, so we are staying in this room for uh, the first keynote speech by Andrew Thacker. So we all stay here, and then we're moving to the different parallel sessions. Dear colleague, on the behalf of the organizing committee, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Thacker from Nottingham Trent University. As m most of us know, Professor Thacker is a distinguished academic and a leading figure in the field of modernist studies. His critical exploration of the role played by magazines and bookshops, along with other literary institutions, has opened new avenues in the study of the complex development of this movement, both on the European and on the, cult on the international scene. By addressing the issue of space and placesness in the conceptualization of such a complex phenomenon, Professor Thacker has indeed highlighted how modernism has helped to articulate the tension of modernity, in particular in national contexts, as well as within specific literary traditions. The fascinating idea of a comprehensive geography of modernism recurs not by chance in various of his recent <coughs> publications. I will only mention a few. Modern in Space and the City, published in 2013, were printed in 2016. Wolf and Geography in a Companion to Virginia Woolf. A True Magic Chamber, the public face of the modernist bookshop. Geography of Modernism and at last, moving through modernity, space and geography in modernism. Beside his personal research, Professor Tucker has been co-director of the Modernist, ma Moders Modernist Magazine project, wi which resulted in three volumes of essays for Oxford University Publishing, the Oxford Critical and Cultural History of Modernist Magazines. 
He has also been editor of the long-running interdisciplinary journal, journal Literary and History, a member of the Center for Travel Writing Studies at Nottingham Trent University. Last but not least, he was a founder member and the first chair of the British Association for the Modernist Studies, whose annual conference is taking place in Birmingham this very week. We particularly thank him for accepting to be here uh, despite this other imminent important commitment that he will join tomorrow. Uh, today, Professor Tekken is giving a keynote speech titled Crossing Borders, Magazine Conflict and the Institution of the Avant-Garde. Without further ado, please, Professor Andrew Tekken. Um, thank you, Andrea. Um, I should first uh, apologize that um, I've got a, a very bad cold um, that I've come down with, so uh, at various points not only will my voice be this kind of horrible gravelly um, sound, I may well cough at various points. Uh, very delightfully, the, the organizing committee have given me a nice cup of tea uh, to try and help my throat here, but um, I I'm, I'm should be fine, I think. Um, thanks also just to the, the scientific committee, the uh, organizers for inviting me. This is my first esprit. I feel kind of bad about that, really, given uh, that I've worked on periodicals for a long time. And I have a number of colleagues and friends that have, have come to esprit and, and said how much they've enjoyed it. So I'm delighted to be here anyway for this one. Um, the, the, the talk that I'm going to give um, is really thinking about uh, the borders as sites of conflict, I think. Uh, that's, that's the kind of way in which I've, I've conceived it. Um, and particularly in relation to notions of the avant-garde. Um, the majority of the examples that I'm going to give will be from kind of modernist, modernist little magazines, but there will be some others. Um, and really that's because that's the area I, I, I know most. Um, I'm aware that, of course, that this conference looks at you know, magazines much more widely. Okay. Um, so I will start. So what is the nature then of the border between the categories of modernism and the avant-garde? Is it a hard border, policed on either side, or a softer, more pliable, liminal space? Of course, any answer to these questions have to address the issue of how we understand these particular terms, modernism and the avant-garde. In one approach, these are substantive descriptions of cultural practices and objects, nouns that indicate a particular content. Susan Sanford Friedman, uh, in a discussion of definitional issues in modernist studies, calls this the nominal mode. She writes, the words modern, modernity, and modernism, and I think we can add avant-garde to those, here signify a specific content, a set of characteristics with particular material conditions. Now, such an approach has, of course, the merit of simplicity, if nothing else, enabling us to distinguish between a modernist poem and an avant-garde poem, a modernist magazine, an avant-garde magazine, drawing relatively firm borders around different kinds of cultural objects. In literary studies, we carry out similar maneuvers all the time, distinguishing between, for example, novels and poems, or between generic categories, such as tragedy and comedy. But, of course, sometimes such borders are crossed, so I'm reminded of a description in Shakespeare's Hamlet of the ability of the actors in the play within a play to perform not only tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, but also plays that are pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, <laughs> pastoral. Um, so in a way, that's a way of thinking, I suppose, about the kind of heterogeneous nature of what we look at, which is magazines in a way. Likewise, we, we might say we've all witnessed debates about whether particular texts or writers can really be labelled as modernist. The early poems of W.B. Yeats, the novels of Ian e. Forster, and so on. Friedman argues that a nominal approach is almost always bound to fail, as it presumes the possibility of a consensual agreement over the meaning of the terms as nouns. A closer look, she writes, reveals little consensus either across disciplines or within them, if what a noun signifies cannot be consistently named, of what use is it as a category? The capacity then to distinguish nominally between modernist and avant-garde is equally fraught. In many Anglo-American circles, these two terms are used interchangeably. 
while many European critics tend to distinguish in complex ways between the two. And in a way, this is the starting point for what I've been thinking about in this paper, just that ver the very different traditions of European people that work on those categories, modernism and avant-garde, and what I, th I think seems to happen in the kind of Anglo-American, the Anglophone world. The point is simply illustrated by um, the different names used by some of the national and international organisations. The MSA um, refers to the Modernist Studies Association, based in the US, while EAM refers to the European Network for Avant-Garde and Modernism Studies. Some form of border between the two categories thus exists in EAM's self-definition. While in the American version, the avant-garde is submerged beneath or into it. Indeed, if you read about the aims of the MSA on their website, there is no mention at all of the term avant-garde. The paper, th this paper then is interested, then, as I've suggested, in exploring the genealogy of this particular feature of the Anglo-American terminology and doing it through the culture of magazines, and particularly modernist magazines. What then of another approach to the terms modernism and the avant-garde? What Friedman calls the relational mode. Seeing the terms as adjectives that only make sense in comparison, just as big and small only have meaning in reference to one another. In this mode, to paraphrase Friedman again, neither modernism nor avant-garde possess a fixed meaning, but acquire sense only in relation to an implied opposite. Thus, modernism might describe a set of experimental techniques and innovations within a wider context of cultural norms, while the avant-garde questions and often rejects the very nature of these norms and practices. Constantine Brancusi, for example, then, in, in this um, line of argument, is a modernist because his innovations in sculptural form, as seen in uh, Golden Bird, the one behind, are still recognisably within the cultural norms of Western sculpture since the Renaissance. In contrast, when Marcel Duchamp exhibited his fountain urinal in 1917, the transformation of a found industrially manufactured object into a sculpture questioned the very nature of the work of art and the artist as craftsman. This makes him avant-garde in that sense. For some then, Duchamp's ready-made, such as Fountain, are in fact not works of art at all, but avant-garde manifestations that aim to critique the institution of art itself in bourgeois society. Now, looking through the kind of the, the kind of theoretical literature on, on uh, these terms, we find that relational definitions of modernism and avant-garde abound. For example, uh, Matteo Kalinescu defines the avant-garde as a more advanced phase of modernism, distinguished by its political rather than its aesthetic character. While Astrid de I. Steinson suggested the difference between the avant-garde and modernism is a very fluid one, characterised by reciprocity and dialogue rather than opposition and contrast. A slightly different approach to the two terms is taken by Raymond Williams, who does not focus upon the content of particular works of art, but upon the historical emergence in the 19th century of artistic movements and their political stance towards society and, importantly, its cultural institutions. So here we have a <coughs> quote from uh, Williams that, that stresses this notion of institutions. He says, initially there were innovative groups which sought to protect their practices within the growing dominance of the art market. So kind of at the end, kind of mid of the 19th century onwards. These developed into alternative, more radical, radically innovative groupings, seeking to provide their own facilities of production, distribution, and publicity. So this would be certain magazines, I think. And then finally, into fully oppositional formations, determined not only to promote their own work, but to attack its enemies in the cultural establishments and beyond. The whole social order in which these enemies have gained now exercise and reproduce that power. So it is, as he says at the end, an attack in the name of art, of this art, on a whole social and cultural order. So for Williams, modernism, I think, refers to that second group, the, that one described as alternative and radically innovative, while the final grouping is clearly that of the avant-garde, described as fully oppositional. 
Yet again, we find a relational aspect to Williams' analysis. Group one develops into group two, which then develops once more into a fully oppositional group, modelled upon that military metaphor of the vanguard, which of course is where we get the notion of the avant-garde from. Um. We can thus distinguish between writers and works described as modernist only by relating them to those perceived as avant-garde. While modernism is alternative, the avant-garde is oppositional. Modernism is a defence of a kind of art, while the avant-garde attacks society in the name of this particular kind of art. One of the difficulties here, of course, is that the purely relational mode soon starts to shade into the nominal mode, and thus will encounter the attendant problems of a lack of consensus. Because, of course, sometimes defence can look like attack, while an oppositional stance might only appear to some as a noisier form of alternative. Now, Williams' account implicitly draws upon Peter Berger's influential text, The Theory of the Avant-Garde, which, of course, is one of the, the, the kind of most uh, well-known theorizations of it, where the avant-garde is distinguished by its attack upon art as an institution and upon the bourgeois conception of art as autonomous from any social purpose. For Berger, avant-garde art is fully oppositional and wishes to integrate art into the praxis of life, returning a social function to the artwork as such. Avant-garde in this sense is opposed to another important current in European aesthetic theory, that of the aestheticism pioneered by Gautier's 1835 uh, preface to Mademoiselle de Maupin and theorised first by Kant in the Critique of Judgment, and which feeds into many currents of modernist culture we might summarise as the, the doctrine of l'art pour l'art the rejection of social purpose for the artwork in favour of its autotelic quality. So this tradition of understanding the avant-garde as distinct from a modernism permeated by ideas of aesthetic autonomy is, to revert to the language of geographical borders, a thoroughly European one, albeit with very diverse national variations. I think it reaches back clearly to the French origin of the term avant-garde as used by the French socialist Saint-Simon in the 1820s. And it's within this European tradition that later critics such as Berg and Williams operate, clearly been influenced by interwar debates between Adorno, Benjamin, Brecht and Lukács. You, you know those um, debates. However, if we shift beyond mainland Europe to the Anglo-American world, we find a quite different history of how the terms modernist and avant-garde have been used. And trying to, to kind of do this, one of the um, places I started was by doing a search through the corpus of the Modernist Journals Project, the MJP, just to see whether the term avant-garde appeared. And um, not surprisingly, it doesn't appear very often. Um, for example, there are only three citations from the Egoist, and you've got that on uh, there, um, but these are for a French magazine, um, so again, it's not referring to a particular English, it's a European example of it, La Vie de Lettre, this magazine. Um, two uses in English are found in the mainstream magazine, Scribner's and McClure's, um, which I've given you just a little bit of on uh, this side, you may not be able to see that, but it's not too important. But they draw directly upon the original military meaning of the term. And I think this emphasizes the claim made in the recent book, uh, Modernism Keywords, by Melba Cuddy Keane and Alexandra Peake, uh, and a kind of an attempt to update Raymond Williams's keywords, but just for kind of modernism, um, where they argue that the sense of avant garde as a revolutionary term is rarely used in English literary texts of the modernist period. Ones that do exist are often, as with the Egoist, indebted to European examples, such as uh, an example in Wyndham Lewis's magazine of 1922, The Tyro, um, for the Dutch magazine The Stil, which will, uh, has the, the advert here, says, uh, present all the avant-garde activities of Holland. Or uh, another example they cite in the modernism keywords is um, from the film journal Close Up, if you know that magazine, which had very close ties to the German film industry in the 20s and 30s and was, of course, published out of Switzerland, even though it was an English language periodical. In the world, then, of magazines, the avant-garde is resolutely European. 
it's shown also, we might say, if we look at the works of historiography um, that first appeared on the avant-garde. Um, and I, I owe this uh, to an article by Evangelio, I think I've, he's sitting over there, the, um, in the Journal of uh, European Periodical Studies, where she notes um, a 1924 survey of magazines between 1870 and 1914, Les Revues d'Avant-Garde, the Avant-Garde Reviews. So by 1924, there's there is European tradition of referring to these magazines as avant-garde. Perhaps the most avant-garde of American periodicals was that of the Little Review. But even this most oppositional of magazine didn't really use the term avant-garde. In 1922, the Little Review, um, <coughs> on the right, um, proudly proclaimed itself to be an advancing point to which, towards which the advance guard is always advancing which was a bold claim in, in the sense that it was trying to say it's actually in front of the avant-garde. By this time, Ezra Pound, based in Paris, was its foreign editor, and the magazine was more closely linked to avant-gardist groups in Europe. So following this, the, the notion of the, the, the avant-garde here, I did another kind of search of the corpus of the MJP and find that there's about 79 uses of that term advance guard in the MJP corpus. So you might think, oh, well, it's just a, that's what happens, it, it gets translated. But again, if you, you drill down to them, the vast majority, unlike the Little Review, draw on that original military sense of the term, as in many, uh, there are many citations from the New Age and Scribners, which clearly don't refer to an aesthetic group, but just a kind of a military group or a group that is in front of other groups. Yeah? So it's not the European avant-garde translated into advance guard. It's also interesting to note that Ezra Pound's pioneering article of 1930, Small Magazines, does not use the avant-garde as a term or any cognate term. And again, it's one of the key uh, Anglophone kind of works of historiography on, on little magazines. It's only in the mid-20th century, the key words authors note, that avant-garde begins to be used by American writers more explicitly. For example, in Frederick Hoffman's um, pioneering The Little Magazine from 1946, we see avant-garde being used interchangeably with the anglophone term uh, advance guard, which Hoffman suggests at one point is perhaps a better name to use for the magazine studied in his book than the more usual epithet Little. And it's kind of an interesting moment, this. He, he doesn't really give any explanation for why he thinks um, advance guard is better than Little. Um, but Hoffman's text once more illustrates this key feature of Anglo-American usage where modernism and the avant-garde seem virtually synonyms. As when it mentions that, for example, the Partisan Review, so the quote there, has presented several studies of Henry James, who has been an important mentor and spirit for many avant-gardists. Now, I quite like Henry James. Henry James has many merits. Um, but being a spiritual mentor to the avant-garde, I would suggest, is not one of the, the <laughs> things that we think about with James. Yeah. So you can see this is a curious use of the term when you look at it through European eyes. Yeah. So the conflation of the terms modernist and avant-garde is also evident in one of the most influential critics in mid-century uh, America, Clement Greenberg. In particular, in Greenberg, we see the reconciliation of what seemed for European critics to be competing traditions. Autonomous art and avant-garde become fused together, and the implied differences between a politicized avant-garde and an aestheticized modernism become lost. So in his famous essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch of 1939, Greenberg argued that the initial alliance between the avant-garde and revolutionary politics soon became decoupled as, he writes, the first settlers of Bohemia, which was then identical with the avant-garde, turned out soon to be demonstrably uninterested in politics. As avant-garde artists detached themselves from bourgeois society, they also repudiated revolutionary politics in order to protect a space in which to keep culture moving in the midst of ideological confusion and violence, and to protect avant-garde culture, the only living culture we now have. Protect it from the commodity culture of 
the mass market, which of course Greenberg at this point refers to as kitsch, but later describes as mass culture. As part of the resistance to kitsch, Greenberg argues, we witnessed the avant-garde artist retiring from the public altogether in order to cultivate art for art's sake. <coughs> Um, to cultivate this, pure poetry and abstraction in um, painting. Thus, in the last bit of the quote here, subject matter or content becomes something to be avoided like the plague. And instead, content is to be dissolved so completely into form that the work of art cannot be reduced in whole or in part to anything not itself. Greenberg thus reverses the narrative found in Will Williams where the defense of a particular kind of art becomes first the self-management of a new kind of art and then, crucially, an attack in the name of this art on a whole social and cultural order. For Greenberg, the initial avant-garde attack on the social order is then replaced by the defense of that notion of aesthetic, aesthetic autonomy. This means that when transplanted beyond European borders into the United States, that important theoretical distinction between avant-garde and modernist really does seem to disappear. Thus, Greenberg, writing in a 1948 um, symposium on the state of American writing, asserts, it seems to me that the most pervasive event in American letters over the last 10 years is the stabilization of the avant-garde accompanied by its growing acceptance by official and commercial culture. It has modified that culture to a limited extent and has in return been granted a recognition of place that do not dissatisfy it. The avant-garde has been professionalized, so to speak, organized into field for careers. It is now no longer the adventure beyond ratified norms, the refusal in the name of truth and excellence to abide by the categories of worldly success and failure. The avant-garde writer gets ahead now and inside established channels. He obtains university or publishing or magazine jobs, finds it relatively easy to be published himself and can even win the status of a public figure. And so in a way, if you went back to um, Peter Berger's argument, you know, this is the, the contrary of what he thinks the avant-garde should be trying to do, though Berger does say, of course, the avant-garde fails um, because of precisely the things that Greenberg says, I think. I think it's a very telling use of the phrase here, gets ahead, because it's revising that original sense of the avant-garde, whose aesthetic exper experiments place them ahead of bourgeois culture, to a meaning borrowed from post-war managerial and business discourse. Now one gets ahead as a part of a career goal of advancement. The use of the term stabilization is also, I think, revealing indicating how an avant-garde which once wished to oppose society, destabilizing it in order to fundamentally change it, is now replaced by an avant-garde which inhabits commercial culture from the inside. Com commercial culture, in turn, recognizes the avant-garde and has a place for it. In crossing then from Europe to the United States, the collapse of this dis division between modernism and the avant-garde has profound consequences for the Anglo-American understanding of modernism per se. As Paul Wood notes, in the New World Order after 1945, Greenberg's vision of an aesthetically autonomous avant-garde came to dominate in the US. And in the context of the Cold War, the depoliticization of the concept of the avant-garde would be established within the aesthetic theory of modernism. This, of course, is an argument explored at length in Serge Guibaud's uh, account of the success of abstract expressionism in that book, uh, How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, which examines Greenberg and others, and uh, how they fed into the kind of post-war creation of an avant-garde that fitted a kind of Cold War ideology in the States. The success of this new paradigm of the avant-garde also explains the definitional difference between European and avant-garde senses of the term noted earlier. For the use of modernism and avant-garde as synonyms in American and, and I think also in many British discourses of modernist studies is arguably one profound effect of this post-war stabilization of the meaning of the aesthetic avant-garde. Now what happens when we introduce um, the complex culture periodicals uh, a little bit more into this discussion? 
Most of the theoretical debates sketched above have ignored uh, the role of magazines. They've normally cited as examples only individual artists or particular works of art, such as paintings, poems, and novels. So the tradition from Berger, Williams, um, all of the, the critics really do not talk very much about magazines as kind of primary texts when defining um, avant-garde. What happens, though, if we reinsert the material culture of magazines into this debate is that it we get a very different picture, I think, of the relation between Moffat and the avant-garde. If we thus regard magazines as our primary texts, rather than Duchamp's Fountain or Joyce's Ulysses, what then do they tell us of how we should interpret the terms avant-garde and modernism? What then does the appearance of Brancusi's Golden Bird, which I used earlier as a bona fide example of modernist artwork, in the mainstream magazine Vanity Fair in May 1922 say about this magazine, or indeed about Brancusi. The fact that Brancusi's illustration, as uh, Richard Mastella has discussed, also appeared in the same period in two other magazines, The Little Review and The Dial, and it's a very interesting article where he looks at the, the appearance of this uh, work of art in those two. Again, points to the complexities of distinguishing the avant-garde from the modernist, when we introduce the rich cultural periodicals. Vanity Fair is clearly not an avant-garde magazine, even though it reported not only on Brancusi, but also gave space to an, an article by Tristan Zara on um, Dada in the same year. However, we might argue that the appearance in Vanity Fair, alongside those adverts for country homes and car design, might be said to negate some of the oppositional edge of the avant-garde as defined by Berger and others. At any rate, Vanity Fair, with its discussion of Zara, seems a long way from a magazine, um, the contemporary, uh, contemporary now, no, uh, from Romania, the homeland of Zara and Brancusi, which is much easier to label as avant-gardist. And one of the, way the, the reasons is because of the, you know, the, the layout, the typography, and the use of a manifesto format throughout it. So what then can we say about the borders of modernism when the modernism we're discussing is that of the textual culture of the periodical? Magazines, of course, fascinating cultural objects for all sorts of reasons, but I think one of the most pertinent for our um, conference theme is almost by definition they refuse to acknowledge borders and <coughs> borders and boundaries, both internally and externally, and often uh, riven by many different forms of conflict. One intrinsic feature of the modernist magazine is the desire to travel without its national passport, we might say, moving perpetually beyond geographical borders into those spaces we describe as the international or the transnational. And uh, again, we might think just about the etymology of the word magazine itself, as magazin, a French, a, a storehouse from the Italian, and then back, up, I think, to uh, an original Arabic term, storehouse. So it's an etymology that travels across borders. In a recent speech in the context of Brexit, uh, the British Prime Minister argued for what I think is a troubling vision of nationalism with strong borders, proudly facing inwards, because she, uh, Theresa May said, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what the very word citizenship means. Um, it's occasioned uh, a much controversy uh, in all sorts of ways when, when she said this in uh, 2016. But this theory of geographical belonging, I think, is precisely the opposite of many modernist and avant-garde magazines where the desire to belong nowhere and instead to wish to take up citizenship within a world community of experimentation is the norm. As Mark and Bradbury and Alan McFarlane noted some 40 years ago, no single nation ever owned modernism. Many, if not most, of its chief creators crossed frontiers, cultures, languages, and ideologies in order to achieve it. Belonging nowhere, refusing artificial borders was, you might say, the watchword of many a, a modernist or avant-gardist magazine. Of course, a very simple point to make about the ability of magazines to cross borders is that by the early 20th century, extensive networks of distribution and communication from the periodical press 
have been in existence, of course, for many decades. Readers in one country could thus easily learn much about modernism in another place from the pages of a magazine. So, for example, the first uh, modernist magazine in Portugal, uh, Orfeu, from 1915, associated with the, the poet Fernando Pessoa, owed much of its innovative quality to the fact that uh, its editors and contributors, Pessoa and uh, uh, Mario de Sao Carniero, had read about futurism, cubism, and expressionism in the pages of three foreign magazines. Uh, and these were Apollinaire's, and apologies for the small size of these, Apollinaire's uh, French magazine, Les Soirées de Paris, the London Vorticist publication, Blast, and perhaps most interestingly of all, uh, in Pessoa's library, he uh, had, an, I think, a subscription to the magazine which was definitely more lowbrow, uh, TP's Weekly. Um, but it was a very interesting magazine in all sorts of ways because it, it was kind of trying to um, kind of present a kind of culture and education to a new kind of lower uh, middle class, working class readership, but often about kind of modernist topics, TP's Weekly. There's a very interesting article by a, a former PhD student of mine, Louise Kane, in the Journal for Modern Periodical Study, precisely about TP's Weekly, but I'd, I'd suggest you look that up. So certain magazines also seem to take the idea of crossing borders as a rationale for their very existence, such as, for example, uh, the magazine Broom. Published in Rome, Berlin, and New York, Broom is an American magazine which starkly demonstrates a willful refusal to observe borders. Um, I was originally going to say a little bit more about Broom because I think it's kind of a, a quite an interesting magazine for the uh, 20s and this idea of crossing borders and a kind of conflict between, again, a European and an American notion of, of the avant-garde. But I, I realise I just have too much information, so I, I'm going to just skip through these and um, move on to the second magazine that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit more about um, Broom um, here um, a bit later. Okay. Um, if many magazines crossed external borders deliberately, such as Broom, it is also the case that internal borders within magazines are difficult to patrol. One reason for this is that magazines are, by definition, of course, heterogeneous cultural objects. We might, for example, seek to draw a border between different kinds of content between that deemed to be recognised as the contents of the magazine, poems, stories, critical essays, and that described perhaps as paratextual, including material produced editorials, adverts, or covers. But even here, the, the border is fluid. It's not a cover such as Blast, such as that of Blast, a key part of how the meaning of vorticism as a movement is communicated. And by now, of course, anyone working in periodical studies is aware of the significance and meanings generated by the adverts contained in magazines. So here's the example I, I often use, which is the magazine uh, Rhythm, um, which used these kind of decorative features by uh, a number of women artists, not only for the, the here, the, the kind of critical article or the poem or whatever, they would use the same kind of illustrative design as part of the advertising material. So there was a kind of blurring of the, the look of the magazine and the, 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 you know, the distinction between different um, parts of it, you might say. And we might also say that as scholars of periodical, we're also uh, well-versed in considering the role of the literal page borders of magazines as more than mere blank spaces. However, the internal border crossing of magazines is also apparent if we try to determine the identity of a magazine by reference to wider cultural categories discussed above between avant-garde and modernism. Part of the difficulty refers back to Friedman's problems with nominal definitions. For what is it that we're really describing when we la label a magazine as avant-garde or modernist or middle-brow? Is it somehow the overall editorial vision, if we can detect that? Or is it the amount of content contained in the magazine that we can apportion to each category? And do we mean the content of each individual issue of the magazine or global total of its contents over the duration of its publication? 
should we consider the amount of material, for example, in the 15 years of the Little Review and following a, a distant reading methodology such as those of Moretti, see what total percentage of material can be labelled avant-garde and which only modernist. The new tools of digital humanities make such a project more easy to contemplate. We would still need to agree in advance upon the particular categories. That is, we'd all need to agree that, for example, the poetry of um, Baroness um, Elsa von Freytag Loringhaven, if you know this uh, remarkable one, is defiantly avant-garde, while the poems of T.S. Eliot, who were both contributors to the Little Review, are merely modernist. And then we might say, what about um, when we find something like this, the residual content? This is fictional verse with no discernible kind of whiff of modernism or the avant-garde, or perhaps even the modern. So in the very first issue of the Little Review, we have this fairly terrible sonnet um, there. <coughs> And of course, that makes you think, when I, when I teach this kind of material um, with my students, and they, they go away and they find this kind of stuff, and they say, I thought this was supposed to be an experimental modernist magazine. I said, well, you know, they're interesting because of the appearance of this kind of stuff, precisely. There's also the question of the diachronic, then. A magazine, over the course of its life, might start as a modernist project, then become avant-garde by dint of publishing much more radical material, only to return to publishing modernist or perhaps merely contemporary or modern work. The case of the first 20 years of the Partisan Review, um, which is what I'm going to turn to um, to my kind of final example, provides an interesting example of the diachronic dynamics of one magazine. The magazine was part of an assortment of left magazines in America in the 1930s. Magazines that attempted to combine radical politics with modernist aesthetics and, in its early forms, proletariat writing. Partisan Review emerged from the New York John Reed Club, the largest of many discussion groups linked to the Communist Party of the USA. And in addition to publishing creative work, foregrounded critical and theoretical debate upon the link between modernist aesthetics and politics. Early issues contained a short story and report on a strike by... Uh, Tilly Olson, who was then Tilly Lerner, uh, essays by George Lukács, poems on the Soviet Union, and a forum on what is a proletariat novel. However, conflict within the American left over Stalinism, Trotsky, the rise of the Popular Front in the <coughs> 1930s saw the magazine shift its focus um, towards a closer intellectual engagement with modernism. In its third issues, two editors, Wallets, Phelps and Philip Ralph asserted that a magazine is a form of criticism and the magazine will now emphasize creative experimentation and critical precision, leaving more immediate political questions to other periodicals such as New Masses. So in a way they left, there was some conception that they left the, the straight politics to these other magazines and then moved it somewhere slightly differently. Partisan Rue was relaunched in 1937 with a new subtitle, A Literary Monthly, which replaced the earlier subtitle, A Bi-Monthly Revolution, uh, A Bi-Monthly of Revolutionary Literature. So you can see the, the drift here. A fascinating editorial statement indicated the magazine had now not only broken from its Communist Party roots, but was also trying to position itself in relation to a division between a politicized avant-garde and an aestheticized modernism. As our readers know, the tradition of aestheticism has given way to a literature which, for its origin and final justification, looks beyond itself and deep into the historical process. But the forms of literary editorship which characterize the magazines of aesthetic revolt were of definite, definite cultural value, and these forms Partisan Review will wish to adapt to the literature of a new period. So in this sense, the magazine attempts to reconcile those aestheticist tendencies within modernism and that avant-garde strain which looks beyond itself into the workings of history. Partisan Review would thus aspire to a place in the vanguard of literature, um, but will be revolutionary in tendency, but independent, they write. The contents of this particular issue indicate the precarious balancing act being proposed by the editors. 
So uh, we find, for example, Delmore Schwartz, his famous story, In Dreams Begin Responsibilities. We get a poem by Wallace Stevens, reviews of Zola, Kafka, uh, along with the English magazine Circle. And in particular, the, the, there is a shift to analyze European modernism rather than left politics in America. But it's the appearance of Picasso in the magazine that most strikingly indicates the new vision of the magazine. <coughs> and this is a quite an interesting piece by Picasso. It's some uh, illustrations, but it's also a short prose poem by him called Dreams and Lies of Franco. Clearly influenced by the automatic writing of surrealism. Um, I'll just a little bit read a little bit to give you a flavour of this. Fandango of lettuces, pickled fish, of swords of cuttlefish, of ill omen, dish rag of hairs, of tonsures, standing in the middle of the frying pan. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure whether that's very good. I mean, I, you can see that Picasso is very good as a painter, maybe not so good as a poet. You know, so. um, what he's addressing, of course, here is the Spanish Civil War. It's imagined obliquely as the products of the beauty of the manure cart, um, the poem goes on to talk about the cries of children, cries of women. And a note states that this represents Picasso's first example of politically inspired art. And the etchings here, which were a first response to the bombing of Guernica, which accompany the poem and show his antipathy for the fascists in the present Spanish conflict. They show an enraged Franco on horseback in the guise of Don Quixote. So this was a kind of dry one for the, the, of course the, the painting of Guernica that he did later in the year. The Picasso image is, however, all the more fascinating in, in being the first instance of visual art that appear in the magazine, signaling the change of emphasis and an attempt to reconcile aesthetic revolt with the revolutionary politics of the day. A few issues later, uh, George Morris writes from... <coughs> Miro and the Spanish Civil War, um, and we produce some more Im images. And so we get a gradual kind of increase in material about abstraction in art, with Morris being one of the people that, that does this. Political discussion is still prominent, but the balance has shifted away from um, Russia and the Communist Party and towards Trotsky and a dissident Marxist critique. Thus, uh, the editors elicited a letter on art and politics from Trotsky in 1938, um, and then also in 1938, they published a manifesto by uh, Diego Rivera and Andre Breton called Towards a Revolutionary Art, which actually was a piece prepared in, in Mexico, but by all accounts, it was actually just Trotsky said, right, this is what should go in the manifesto, and Rivera and Breton just kind of copied it down. So it's, it's Trotsky all the name. Um, the manifesto rejected the totalitarian regime of the US, SR, proposed the formation of International Federation of Independent Revolutionary Art, and ends with this slogan, the independence of art for the revolution, the revolution for the complete liberation of art. As uh, Serge Guilbeau puts it, the magazine now tried to orientate itself around an alliance of an unspecified nature between a political avant-garde and an artistic avant-garde. <coughs> This alliance continues throughout 1938 to 1939. We get work from a number of other writers, E. Cummings, Wallace Stevens, British writers such as Auden, Louis McNeese appear, poetry by Gertrude Stein appear in 1939. Um, and as the world lurches towards world war, the alliance between the political avant-garde and the aesthetic avant-garde becomes somewhat untethered. In a review of two exhibitions of American art in spring 1939, George Morris explores the relationship between avant-garde abstraction and the external world. One exhibition of his is of American abstract art, while the other is the American Artist Congress, which has a kind of, we might characterize as a more realist mode of painting. Morris contrasts the two in the following way. And I, I kind of won't read um, through this, but in essence, what uh, Morris is, is arguing here is that while the representational art of the Congress merely illustrates the crevices in the old social order in a direct way, it is the abstract artists who are, who are more radical, attempting to reorder things in a classic 
And in a classic avant-garde formulation that prefigures Berger, and we may also think of Adorno here, attack the established conceptions of art itself. So the alliance of abstraction and the avant-garde in American art was really kind of established, I think, from here, and uh, was a profound consequence for the rise of American abstract expressionism. But what of the idea of the avant-garde as an inherently political project? The reorientation of the magazine's cultural politics was um, continued in the last two issues of 1939, which were dominated by a symposium on the situation of American writing. Uh, an editorial by Philip Ralph, Twilight of the Thirties, pessimistically signaled the fate of the avant-garde. He said, in the face of a, a shrinking of the cultural market, we witnessed the withering away of literature. No avant-garde movement to speak of exists any longer, he says. After the experiments and innovations of the 20s, which he linked to an avant-garde tradition of more than 100 years of rebellions and counter-rebellions, this tradition is now drawing to a close. So for Rav in 1939, the avant-garde is finished. Um, and he goes on to talk about the, the uh, current political crisis uh, will not r result in a new uh, avant-garde. He says, I do not believe that a new avant-garde movement in the proper historical move, uh, sense of the term can be found in this pre-war situation. So what he talks about instead is dissident. The dissident artist will replace the avant-garde artist. However, in the next issue, at the end of 1939 and with the world at war, we now see an article that offers a different trajectory, a recuperation for the avant-garde in America, one which radically alters the nature of how it is understood. This, of course, is the article I mentioned earlier, Clement Greenberg's Avant-Garde in Kitsch, that, of course, you may know uh, first appeared in Partisan Review in 1939 and which, of course, defended, as I said earlier, the sense of the avant-garde as autonomous art that was not politically engaged. As Paul Wood argues in Greenberg, the autonomy of the avant-garde represents not so much an escape from the world as a defense mechanism for the survival of art in the modern world. After 1945, Greenberg's vision of an aesthetically autonomous but non-political avant-garde dominates in the U.S. during the Cold War, most prominently seen in his promotion of Jackson Pollock and abstraction. In another sense, Greenberg's essay marked the transfer of power from a European model of the avant-garde to a new American version. This is seen most strikingly in a 1941 essay by Greenberg on the renaissance of the little magazines. There's a little review that he does of five new American magazines. The article opens with a bold assertion <coughs> that there is a revival underway, it seems, in avant-garde writing in this country. So a claim that obviously, you know, is completely um, opposed to the one that, you know, Rav, the editor, was despairing about the disappearance of the avant-garde. So Greenberg says, oh, no, the avant-garde's alive, it's, you know, flourishing. Um, Greenberg then suggests the reasons for this revival is th um, the exhaustion of accepted writing, the influx of writers and artists from Europe during the war. All this points to the emergence of the USA as the new home of the avant-garde, with the realization that this country is the only important place left where it is still possible to pursue culture without the too immediate interference of events. In other words, we are on the spot. If writing as creative activity is not to disappear, it is up to us. So in a way, it's a kind of breathtaking kind of grab for the notion of the avant-garde, you might say. Here. So if writing is us, we, we're going to do it now. You know. Greenberg thus looks at the resurgence of the little magazine format as an indication that America is taking up the baton of the avant-garde but in a transformed format. Let us hope, he says, that there would not be too much repetition of the old attitudes, the old affectations, the old stunts. Bec not because the new is valuable, just because it is new, but because the old, the conventionalized attitude of the avant-garde are bankrupt. The situation has changed. One picks up these new magazines in the hope of hearing goodbye said to a good many conventions of experimentation, of experiment, with all the rights, ignorance, enfant terribles, and boredom <coughs> that went with it. 
So for Greenberg, the old bankrupt avant-garde seems to be that of Europe. The new avant-garde that will live will be that found in America. We might say the subsequent career of Partisan Review was established here. Uh, as Michael Rosendale suggests, Partisan Review now attempted to reclaim the tradition of a high modernist magazine. It was a kind of custodial project, preserving a tradition from erasure from mass culture, which in many ways was quite conservative. A 1941 issue uh, features one of Eliot's four quartets. Uh, East Coker had already been printed in 1940, along with the Southern Agrarian, Alan Tate, Greenberg on uh, Paul Clay, and Saul Bellow starts to show this kind of shift. And I think the publication of Eliot in particular is very striking, given that only a few years earlier, one of the editors, Wallace Phelps, had reviewed Eliot's critical work after Strange Gods, with, you might remember, it's very anti-Semitic remarks where Eliot says it's a very bad thing to have too many free-thinking Jews. Uh, and Phelps says, well, only the blind would hesitate now to call Eliot a fascist. You know, so that's about a few years earlier they're saying, Eliot, no. Now Eliot <laughs> is being published in the magazine. And of course, one of the ironies of this is that large numbers of the people associated with the Partisan Review were, of course, Jewish. They were part of the New York intellectuals and were free thinking. So it's an kind of astonishing kind of turnaround, you might say. This new articulation of aesthetics and politics in the 40s laid the groundwork for the New York intellectuals of the 50s. The magazine was transformed into something of a Cold War institution. <coughs> <coughs> that it was to become, like a number of other magazines in the 50s and 60s, partially funded by the CIA through the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and I know some people have done some really interesting work that's been published on, on that, it may seem an odd journey for a magazine with its origins in the American Communist Party. Regardless of this irony of history, the role of Partisan Review in entrenching the Anglo-American critical discourse, in the entrenching within Anglo-American critical discourse, a definition of the term avant-garde that sees it as a synonym for modernism, cannot be overlooked. And I think Greenberg's essay is absolutely fundamental here. It's one of the most kind of critically reproduced um, pieces of writing within uh, modernism, you might say. Okay, just to, to finish um, then, it was Astrid Einsteinson who suggested that the difference between the avant-garde and modernism in reality is a very fluid one, characterized by reciprocity in dialogue. A single text, he writes, is very often both modernist and avant-garde. The point's clearly borne out if we foreground the material culture of magazines rather than focus on isolated works of art as our exemplars of modernist or avant-garde practice. If, as critics such as Berger and Williams and others argue, one key definition of the avant-garde lies in its different attitude towards cultural institutions, then it seems vital to pay much more attention to the how and why of the institutions of um, magazine publishing produced such a massive flourishing of the small periodical, but of course many other periodicals, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. The single issues of many modernist magazines do indeed contain both modernist and avant-garde elements, a feature that is only magnified when we consider the complete run of a magazine. In Partisan Review, we discover a magazine whose historical trajectory tracks, I've argued, a key set of debates within modernism, over the conflict between aesthetics and politics. It demonstrates that we can only understand the predominant Anglo-American use of the term avant-garde by understanding how, I think, the history of something like Partisan Review paved the way for Greenberg's essay and for that kind of uh, definition. We need then to think much more deeply about what the very institution of the modernist magazine, and in particular its particular instances, such as Partisan Review, can tell us about what we talk about when we talk about modernism and the avant-garde and the kinds of borders that permeate how we use these terms. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I say apologies again for crooking. I'm going to have one of my many forms of medication now. It's cough sweet. <laughs> It's a wonderful uh, speech. It's uh, very interesting.
Santos Pino, who will show us how avant-garde and uh, modernism were uh, in a fluid relationship and how these relationships change uh, during the year. So do we have time for um, one, two questions from the public? Hello. Hi, Burgess. Hi. Hello, <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, I have a question and um, sort of bring in another term that is perhaps more prevalent in European criticism mm -hmm. than Anglo-American criticism, which is the arrière garde, yeah, yeah. right? So mm. the avant-garde and the arrière garde. Mm. And I'm wondering whether that would make for a similar kind of history or a different kind of history or mm. how you think about um, mm. that. Mm. That's a very good question. I mean, I think that, um, um, as you say, has much more valency and currency within European circles, but it's probably one that would um, benefit Anglo-American scholars to think about a little bit more. Um, how you would run that through what I was talking about, um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I guess it would certainly enable you perhaps to talk about certain magazines uh, in quite interesting ways as you know, neither modernist nor avant-gardist, but somehow um, moving between those categories. And I suppose that's, the, in a way, I, I, you know, with the example of some, you know, Vanity Fair and some of these other magazines, the it's about the composite nature of these. So it, it, and, you know, over a period of time, they change. I think it's very difficult for us to say that this is resolutely, entirely an avant-garde magazine. So I think it's about you, so you could use categories like the Ariel Guard, um, you know, the Middle Brow, uh, a whole number of them, and it just gives much more nuance to, to when we talk about magazines, I think. So it's kind of, yeah, um, thanks. Other questions? Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I wanted to know about um, the poem um, on the symphony, the oh major right. symphony. And I wondered, um, I mean, what you made of this inclusion. I mean, is this, you know, were you able to kind of relate it to modernism in terms of anesthesia, or were you, you know, looking at the hypothematicity of countries and whether mm. that was part of your way of approaching things, or mm. To explain items in yeah. the issues mm. uh, yeah. when we're attempting to you know, use those terms to give them life. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I find this all the time, really, when, when I, I teach this material, because I, I ask my students to, um, we look at the, the corpus of material mainly on the MJP, and I, I say for the seminars, go away and bring something to the seminar that you've read that you really like or you found interesting and um, you, then they can just give a very short presentation. Um, and one of the great things about that is, you know, I learn stuff because, I, I, you know, there's things I thought I hadn't seen that. And this may be a poem that somebody brought along and said, well, what is this doing here? Yeah. Um, and that's what, <laughs> what is it doing there? Well, I suppose you could say... Um, that it's the early part of, the, it's the very first issue of the Little Review. It could be about questions of, well, we've got to fill up the magazine with something. Uh, could, yeah, it could be filler. It could be that the person has, I mean, I've, I haven't kind of investigated very much, and I probably should do, that the person has a personal connection with one of the editors. Um, <laughs> it could be that they're wanting to show that, you know, We've got this, but we've got this much more interesting stuff in the rest of the magazine. Um, what you would have to do, I guess, is to go back and look, does this kind of material disappear from the Little Review? Now, instinctively, I think it probably does. Certainly, I, I would feel it probably does when it gets to Europe. Um, but um, the fact that it's there at all, and there probably are other examples of similar kinds of material, because I found it so often when I've been teaching, does talk, as you said, about the heterogeneity and the, you know, interesting stories about whether it's there as filler 
personal reasons and so on. Um, the first issue of the little uh, first issue of the little review. Um, oh gosh, can anybody remember? remember? Was it 1915? Was it or 14? 1914, wasn't it? Uh, Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I see what you mean. Yep. Yeah. I have to say, I suppose I just looked at it and said, oh, it's a sonnet, you know, very traditional sonnet, and then didn't really look much further than that. You probably should do, yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question, yeah. So may maybe a reminder for myself to go and do a bit more close reading when I do these things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe once more, the last one. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Hi. That was very, very, very interesting. The question is, um, do we come to a conclusion or not? I mean... <laughs> about what? About, about how these um, magazines deal with the two terms. Mm. I mean, you have shown brilliantly, I think, that uh, once we get into the material culture of magazines, things get so complicated mm. and the borders are so movable that the question is, where do we get or do we just admit that it is much more difficult to define uh, differences than expected and do we have to look closer at mm. the raw material? I think uh, pr probably the, 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 um, the last point, yes, that we need to look much more closely at the material to see um, what kind of, when we use, we, we often use these labels, don't we, all the time, b because they are convenient to talk about a middle brown magazine or a mainstream magazine or a modernist magazine. Um, but of course it is very difficult once you drill down to look at the more detailed material within them sometimes to maintain those kind of categories. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I think you, it's a matter of um, thinking about the elements of those particular categories that appear in both individual magazines, but also a, an entire run of a magazine. So that's why I kind of hinted at, you know, you could do the kind of Moretti kind of approach where you took for example, the entire run of the, the Little Review and, and kind of uh, decided what percentage of it was absolutely avant-gardist and what percentage of it was more something else and so on. Um, I don't know whether then that would consistently be able to reveal um, something about those individual magazines. I mean, I suppose at one level I was just also in just very interested when I was doing this, just the way that the, the, the term avant-garde, you know, gets moved through these magazines and the difference between the European and the American context. And I, um, I suppose it's always been a, um, from doing the, the work on the modernist magazines volumes, particularly when we got to do the third volume and, and um, Sasha Brew that we, we did that one with, was very insistent that the avant-garde was such a key term and in a way that it wasn't in the, uh, the other ones. And I, I just started to think, why is that? Where does that come from? And I'm almost convinced that it's almost like Clement Greenberg. You know, this is one essay that does this, more or less. Uh, it really kind of just says, this is what the avant-garde means in Anglophone news, um, which is quite extraordinary for one essay in one quite small magazine to have that kind of impact. Curiosity and a question. The uh -huh. curiosity is about Broom, uh, Broom the, ma yeah. the magazine you didn't have time to speak mm. about. Um, it was published in New York, Rome, and Berlin. Mm -hmm. So my, curi my curiosity is about which groups were involved, especially in Rome, mm -hmm. in this journal. And um, okay, the question: uh, the uh, little review, the av avant-garde review. Um, how were, were mm, how did they define themselves? Because the equivalent in, Italian, uh, in the Italian literary field uh, were magazines defined as produced by youngsters. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. do you have mm. something like that in the Anglo-American world? 
magazine produced by the youngsters, Le Jeune or something, I think you get in the, in the kind of French, don't you? Yeah. Um, well, Mark, Mark Morrison makes that point about youthfulness, say, in the American magazine Poetry and Little Review. Um, and he, uh, I think in another one he talks about in the, that book, The Public Face of Modernism, he links the, the poetry and the Little Review to um, being published in Chicago as a kind of youthful new city and capturing the kind of energies of a, a new kind of... Um, you know, industrial expansion within America. So the, the definitely, I think that that is probably true. Um, perhaps mm, it's, it, it may well be quite different. I suspect the, the, the I know the, this kind of sense of youthfulness um, there. Um, I mean, Ford Maddox Ford uses Lejeune as a term when he talks about the image of poets, for example. Um, so he. But uh, again, he's borrowing a particular kind of French tradition way of using that. So I suspect it's probably there in some of the magazines um, that that um, we could look at, but perhaps not quite as forcefully as, as, the, as the sort of the Italian one. Um, Broom in Rome. Well, this is one of the things that's very interesting, that it um, was linked to a number of um, futurist artists. So Prampolini... Um, designs one of the covers, uh, Prampolini. Um, a number of other futurists are linked to it, but in a kind of slightly tenuous way. And one of the reasons is that the uh, Americans come to, um, one of the reasons given for it is the, the Americans come to these countries and look at kind of things like futurism and, and surrealism and so on and think, hey, that's really exciting, you're really doing something different. We're not doing this in America. And a number of the artists, so Marinetti, I think, uh, has a conversation with the, the, uh, <coughs> <coughs> the editor of Broom, and Marinetti says, but you're, what you're doing in America is wonderful, skyscrapers, automobiles. Yeah. So the Americans go, so what, America is good after all? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very interesting magazine that, that, that goes backwards and forwards between... Um, different notions of the kind of national and the international. Um, it's at one point it's called a, an international magazine of Americans in Europe. Um, the end, the final issues goes back to New York and there's in a sense the, the encounter with the European avant-garde has kind of suggested the Americans need to produce their own avant-garde. Um, that might be one of the things that, that you find in those final, final issues. So I think it's very interesting magazine for those encounters, really, um, there. But it's certainly kind of futurism and surrealism, perhaps being left to its own company as well. So, so <coughs> thank you again, Professor Thacker. And uh, now we stop for a little coffee break at the upper floor. And then we start again at 11 and a half or something like that. <laughs> <I hope. laughs> thank you. A transnational perspective. I'm Laura Brake and I'm chairing it and we have four speakers um, and I thought that I would introduce them as they speak. All right and if you could I mean um, given that we're we have four speakers and that we're running a little late to begin with even I think that we should try and write down our questions after each talk and then uh, have a general discussion you know with question Q and A after, if that's all right with everyone. So I encourage you, as speakers, to keep to your twenty minutes, and I'll be signalling wildly from the left, and don't ignore me. <laughs> and um, and I'll introduce um, our first speaker, who is um, Professor Patrizia um, Nerazzi. No, I'm going to move. I'm going to move, and you can do what you like. Okay, I will move in seconds. <laughs> So our first speaker is uh, Professor Emerita um, Patrizia Nerazzi, um, who works here at, um, um, in English literature at IULM. And um, she works on the history of the novel, 18th century British literature and art, new communication uh, technologies and visual arts and literature and the law. And she's written um, extensively, but um, um, 
in particular on Lawrence Stern, on Samuel Richardson, on Jane Austen, and the Gothic novel. And she's also the director of the Tristram Shandy web, uh, website, um, which has the you know, usual uh, URL of tristramshandyweb.it. And um, she's also a member of the editorial board of Polymus, I'm, I'm not sure about the um, accent, Journal of Law, Literature, and Culture. Um, and she's published most recently in 2008, um, um, Il Romanzo Inglese dei Settecento, La Poetica al Originale della Narrativa Moderna. Okay. <laughs> You left something there. Uh, it's here, I think. So the title of my paper is Mrs. Crackenthorpe versus Mr. Isaac Bickerstaff, a lady's answer to the settler. Can you hear me? Yes. When on the 8th of July, 1709, the female settler was launched for the first time in the streets of London, Edison and Steele's settler had been published for three months. The settler appeared three times a week, the new double-sided sheet was issued three times as well on alternating days. Obviously, the printer's advertising strategy was to present it as a complement to rather than a competitor of a tattler, whose success and already familiar name undoubtedly provided a remarkable advantage with the public. The new journal's author introduced herself with the name of Phoebe Crackenthorpe, a lady who knows everything. Mrs. Crackenthorpe is believed to be the pseudonym of Mary de la Riviere Manley, playwright and successful author of scandalous bestsellers. She was to be the author of the first 51 issues of the paper Till, till it was taken over by the joint authorship of a society of ladies, a society of modest ladies, who in their turns will oblige the public with whatever they shall meet with that will be diverting, innocent, or instructive. The female tattler, number one. A probable explanation is that Mrs. Manley had been arrested for seditious libel due to her satirical discrediting portrayal of many prominent Whig politicians controlling Queen Anne's government in her scandalous Romanacle secret memoirs from the New Atlantis, 1709. The last extant issue of the female Tetler is dated the 31st of March, 1710. On the 26th of September, 1710, Addison and Steele's Tetler declared the female Tetler officially dead. Mrs. Manley's life was an adventurous one. She was one of the first popular women writers, a lady of dubious reputation, involved in love and political intrigues at a very high level, including the court, even accused of being a spy. The publication history of the female Tetler, which also includes a spurious paper, the fake female Tetler, is a rather intricate one for lack of reliable documentary evidence and is still under scholarly investigation. It is now generally recognized that the female Tatler was the chief early rival of Richard Steele's Tatler. However, an eminent 18th century scholar like Roy Porter considered the female spectator, 1744, 
written by Eliza Haywood, the first magazine written by, for, and about women, as according to his opinion, the female tattler was an all-male affair. These are few cursory biographical and bibliographical references are mentioned here just to introduce the subject of my paper on the conflict, the rivalry between Mrs. Crackenthorpe and Isaac Bickerstaff Esquire, Steele's pseudonym in the Tatler. They are strongly competing, ironically debating in defensive of their respective journal. I hope Isaac Bickerstaff Esquire will not think I invade his property by undertaking a paper of this kind. From the first issue of the female tattler, Mrs. Crackenthorpe, sum canna vocalis, as she had it written on her journal, printed around her portrait like on an emblem, wants to provoke a debate with Isaac Bickerstaff. By ironically referring to her rival's commercial success as to an arbitrary usurped property, Mrs. Crackenthorpe makes the first and clever move to promote her own paper. In the first issue of the Tatler, Isaac Bickerstaff had declared in his typical patronizing voice that he had chosen the title of his publication in honor of the fair sex. Yet, as Mrs. Crackenthorpe claims in a sharp retort, he has invented nothing new. Even the title of his paper has been suggested by the lady's word. Since Tatling was ever a judge peculiar to our sex. Women are a strong part in, in the world, she claims, especially in the reader's world in the early 18th century, as we know. Nobody denies, she goes on, that the Tatler had declared to be interested in the improvement of ladies. Nevertheless, it has now become her specific purpose and duty to consult the honor and interest of the ladies with as much fervency as the male tatter does that of the gentleman. Actually, she concludes, the tattler has proved to be the male tattler. Mrs. Crackenthorpe's remarks trigger a lively discussion, staging a battle of sexes where the proof, the demonstration of her credibility as the author of the female tattler becomes of vital importance. Isaac Bickerstaff declare, declares to be caught in the fashionable world of London coffee and chocolate houses, the best places where to collect foreign and domestic news already sorted out by the subject. All accounts of gallantry, pleasure and entertainment shall be under the article of White's Chocolate House, poetry under that of Will's Coffee House, Learning under the title of a Grecian foreign and domestic news, you will have from St. James's Coffee House. Mrs. Crackenthorpe refuses to be considered less reliable just because it is women's destiny to spend their lives in domestic interiors, not in public places. As a matter of fact, she has decided to convert her own drawing room into a newsroom, her journal's editorial office, where she enjoys a dominant position, like the queen of a small court, granting audience to her loyal messengers, illustrious and fashionable friends who come to inform her of the latest news in town. As chief editor, it is in the variety of their conversation that she gathers and selects the miscellaneous subjects 
for her journal, where books are canvassed, removals at court suggested, law cases disputed, the price of stock told, the bold and ladies inform us of new fashions. Yet, her drawing room, the English version of the Salon de Conversation, never had the least ill character, she assured her, her readers, though a foolish baronet once called it the scandal office, half a nation visits me when I have a true history of the world. It is not gossip, but facts that make a good journalist. Both Isaac Bickerstaff and Mrs. Crackenthorpe place themselves solidly at the center of their narratives. Nevertheless, as Mrs. Crackenthorpe knows even too well, it is her position which may prove dangerous, precarious indeed. She is often called in defense not only of her reliability, but also of her credibility as the author of her paper. The evidence produced, the testimony submitted to the reader's court, lies in a question of fact. The author cannot be a woman. Mrs. Crackenthorpe can do nothing less than becoming so violent an advocate for her own sex. Whereas several ill-bred critics have reported about town that a woman is not the author of this paper, which I take to be a splenetic and irrational aspersion upon our all sex. Women were always allowed to have a finer thread of understanding than men. These detractors could never gain admittance to a fair sex, and all such I forbid my drawing room. The female tattler number 11. Unluckily, she has to consider she lives in a country where women are sentenced to an endless conversation on trivial matters. The French nation have so complacent a regard for the fair sex. But English ladies, the moment they rise from dinner, are packed off to their tea tables, where they spend half their life's time in talking of fans and teacups sugar tongs, salt shovels, and gloves made up in walnut shells. The French salon loom far away together with the social role of the so-called fair sex and its impact on public life. In contemporary England, it is gloves made up in walnut shells that project an exquisite glimpse of social history. The question of gender emerges and re-emerges in the female tattler as a thorough bath, illustrating, visualizing the topic of the controversy in thoroughly enjoyable period pieces, witty repartees, and exemplary stories. In the second issue of the female tattler, a lady coupler, a soi-disant acquaintance of Isaac Bickerstaff, turns up to put a premature end, a happy ending indeed, to the competition between Crackenthorpe and Bickerstaff, proposing their marriage. What wondrous thing might two such headpieces in conjunction produce? In such a way, their sons will be bound to become bishop, bishops, judges, and recorders, and their daughters, Benz, Phillips, and Dacier, that is to say, popular authors different roles for different genders. Isaac Bickerstaff still 
pretends to be puzzled by the old puzzled, sorry, by the old biblical question and writes a short dissertation on human as a destroying fiend or guardian angel, Mrs. Krakenthorpe plays her part, defending the innate intelligence of women, even if she admits they should spend some time in cultivating their minds and take more pains to place their words than their patches. The society I aim at are those above the common level, gentlemen that not only talk good common sense, but can state an argument in any art or science and dispute learning, judgment, and force of reason. I would have the ladies to relish somewhat above mere tittle tattle, the female tattler number three. By fusing exemplary stories with the troubles of current day life, criticizing want of decorum, as well as denouncing snobbery and rude manners, the female tattler paints a realistic picture brimming with recommendations which illustrates a more than unprejudiced view on the condition of the upper classes at the beginning of a long century, when social rank is menaced by the money of the rapidly, too rapidly rising new classes. Her voice is clear. Those tradesmen who have money should not flaunt themselves and affect to a class which is not there. Nevertheless, women's life can be badly affected by marriages based more on rank than on fortune. Girls should never behave like the women of her own family who married, who were always more inquisitive about the antiquity and virtue of the families they married into than about their jointures. The female tattler number 43. Not differently from Isaac Bickerstaff, who proclaims himself devoted to the mending of, of manners, Mrs. Cla uh, Krakenthorpe's declared role in her life and writing is gently to correct the vices and vanities which some of distinction, as well as others, willfully commit. The female tattler summarizes the general rule in a few words. You are told your faults in order to amend them. However, as Mrs. Krakenthor points out, it is undeniable that sometimes the universal faith in the malleability, that's the 18th century term, the malleability, perfectibility of the uh, individual can be badly shaken, no matter how hard you have been working on the reader's reformation of manners and morals. She addresses her paper to women and men as well, just I. Uh, like Isaac Bickerstaff. Therefore, it is with him that she can share ideals and intents together with disappointments. Would anyone suppose when tattlers are daily published that people should be so horridly silly, but as the ingenious Mr. Bickerstaff says, when may write to eternity, the world is still the same. Is there a better promotion for the female tattler than assimilating it to its rival paper, making the tattlers surrender to the same enemies? The so often mentioned principle of variety does not contradict, albeit correspond to the general principles of human nature. Those were the glorious years of the beginning of modern journalism, when the interrelation of literary forms introduces new kinds of narratives. 
the debate between the two fictional masks of Mrs. Crackenthorpe and Isaac Bickerstaff can be watched as a theatrical performance on the rules of social gain. Mrs. Crackenthorpe proves a vivid reporter from the front line, a clever defender of women's condition. Isaac Bickerstaff plays the perfect gentleman, gentleman, but his proclaimed interest in the conversation part of our lives often reveals a misogynist strain, especially when he lends his pen to one of his women correspondents. Concluding, it is well known that the Tetla was closed down on the 2nd of January 1711. To avoid the complications of running a weak publication that had come under Tory attack. Two months later, Steele and Addison founded The Spectator. In one of her last numbers of her periodical, Mrs. Crackenthorpe had written an appeal to her readers. For shame, gentlemen and ladies, dismiss your follies and bid adieu to your indiscretions, that this tattler of mine may have no subject to go upon and consequently be suppressed without making interest with authority. The female tattler number 42. But in the last number, Mrs. Crackenthorpe, resenting the affront offered to her by some rude citizens altogether unacquainted with her person, gives notice that she has resigned her pretensions of writing the female tattler to a society of modest ladies. After her resignation, Mrs. Crackenthorpe leaves the reader to wonder what would become of her. No clue can be found in the numbers of the female tattler written by a society of ladies. Only a note from a brief historical relation of state affairs by Narcissus Luttrell, quoted in the female Tatler's edition by Fidelis Morgan, could explain her sudden resignation. Today, the printer and publisher of a new Atlantis were examined, touching the author, Mrs. Malley. They were discharged, but she remains in custody. Thank you. I leave the historians, um, that is the visibility uh, <coughs> and um, identity of women editors. Um, and we have um, three speakers now who are uh, miraculously and um, skillfully um, uh, given uh, a large uh, grant uh, uh, by um, the ERC um, to look at uh, women editors uh, across Europe. It's called Agents of Change. Uh, and um, its um, remit is Women Editors and Sociocultural Transformation in Europe between 1710, so the 18th century, the 19th century, and the beginning of the 20th to 1920. So that's quite a sweep. And it's very ambitious. It's, it's looking at uh, a number of different languages. Um, it's um, uh, based and originated in the University of Ghent. Um, uh, in Belgium, and um, we have now um, three uh, workers uh, doing the, um, the coalface research uh, on this project. 
The second um, speaker in this panel is Christina Bizzari. She's a PhD candidate at Ghent, and she's working with Marianne van der Mortel, whose project this uh, is as PI. And um, she's um, looking at the literary salon in Spain, um, Italy, Portugal, and Greece, a small, a small conspectus of work, you know, and uh, kind of languages. Uh, and it gives you a, uh, an indication, I think, of the uh, range of this project and its ambitions. I mean, I think it is really, uh, you know, I mean, we've all perhaps know um, Andrew, most, uh, Andrew um, Backus' um, three-volume um, uh, uh, project on and, and books on uh, modernism, uh, which include a whole volume on Europe. Um, and this is, um, uh, if you like, an 18th century and 19th century, you know, kind of similarly uh, ambitious attempt to look at um, this phenomenon of women editors across uh, Europe. Um, um, Christina is um, going to be talking to us on um, um, sorry, Elizabeth Camier Toura uh, against Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Literary Salon, Female Periodicals, and the Gradual Shift in the Paradigm of Domesticity. This follows on very nicely, doesn't it? Good morning to everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us the great opportunity uh, to participate in this conference. Uh, second of all, I would like to thank Professor Brake for her generous introduction. And of course, I would like to thank all of you for being among us, amongst us today. I will begin by uh, describing a conflict of ideas between an Italian woman editor called Elisabetta Caminertura and a French philosopher who you already know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, before explaining uh, the premises of this conflict, I would like to say a few words about the setting of this conflict, which is the literary salon of the 18th century, a literary institution that uh, thrived both in France and in Italy, in, uh, especially during the second half of the 18th century. Uh, so the setting of the conflict is the literary salon. However, the means through which Elisabetta expressed her opinions was the periodical. Uh, so periodical publications were scarce uh, during the 18th century in Italy. However, Elisabetta was uh, a lot ahead of her time using her, uh, her periodical publications as a means to attack uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's views on the participation of uh, women in both the private uh, sphere and the public dialogue. Um, and from my title, you can see the outcome of this conflict, which is, in my view, the gradual shift in the paradigm of domesticity. Uh, a few words about the origins of the conflict. So first of all, the question that we should ask ourselves is whether the salons in Paris were considered to be a threat or an ally um, to, um, to the intelligentsia of that, uh, of that epoch, of, the, of that uh, particular period of time. Um, in a famous letter to uh, his friend, D'Alembert, Jean-Jacques Rousseau questions the ability of women to participate in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the public arena, and uh, he questions salons before uh, talking about participation in the public arena because he feared that if women were able to have a significant impact on a private conversation, they would then extend this impact to the public. Uh, so I quote from this letter. Here I'm going to give you some backstage information because this um, citation, this quote, is from a letter that Rousseau sent to D'Alembert. And uh, the translation is from Alan Bloom, so it's not my own translation. I use translations because I don't want to confuse you with three different languages. This is um, written in French originally, and uh, of course I'm going to read the translation in English. So I quote Rousseau. Imagine what can be the temper of the soul of a man who is uniquely occupied with the important business of amusing women and who spends his entire life doing for them what they owe to do for us. Um, I think that this quote speaks for itself, however I will take the time to analyze it. Um, 
who, who saw, um, thought that uh, women's impact on, uh, in salons would influence lifestyle and manners. Uh, of course, we're talking about the upper middle class, so the, the, the people who had access to these private spaces. Because as you might as well know, not everyone had access to these um, private sp spaces in Paris. Um, later on in this uh, letter, he says, uh, uh, I quote, as for us, we have taken on entirely contrary ways, mainly devoted to the wills of the sex which we owe to protect and not serve. We have learned to despise it in obeying it, to insult it by our derisive attentions. And every woman in Paris gathers in her apartment a harem of men more womanish than she. Um, end of quote. Uh, so Rousseau really attacked this salon culture, although he himself participated in salons. Uh, his friend Alambert was um, attending uh, the famous salon of Madame de l'Espinas. Madame de l'Espinas was a leading salonnière, a very important figure in uh, French Enlightenment. And uh, the idea of participating in her own salon uh, made Rousseau very wary of uh, female impact. Um, he also uh, said in his letter, and I quote, unable to make themselves into men, the women make us into women. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. Once again, Rousseau is expressing his fears um, against women who led those salons. In 1768, Rousseau visited Venice and stayed in Palazzo Studian Bellotto. This is a very important information because um, Rousseau visited Italy and became familiar with Italian manners. Uh, salons in Italy were, um, were not as... Um, uh, were not considered to be as corrupted uh, as uh, French salons in the sense that uh, Italian salons were con considered to be uh, spaces, uh, of course, of uh, political conversation, but also the aesthetic aspect, the aesthetic value of salon was of prominent importance. Uh, in that sense, Rousseau uh, feared that women would have an impact on arts, and um, he, uh, he especially... Uh, explained this in his, um, in his uh, letter about uh, French salons, but he saw the same threat, the same menace, also in Italian salons. Um, let's move on forward to see uh, Elisabetta Camilletura. Uh, she was from Venice, uh, she was born in Venice, and she had um, a father who was a journalist. Her, father, um, her father's journal had, uh, the, uh, had uh, the title Europa Letteraria, and it was published for from 1768 to 1773. Uh, so Camille, she, she started her career as a translator of Voltaire. Voltaire. Uh, she translated Voltaire and Du Bellay from uh, French to Italian. Uh, so she played the role of a cultural mediator between France and uh, Italy. Uh, she later on published a few reviews uh, by English women who wrote essays on the evolution of uh, female participation, um, female education. Uh, f the first review that um, Elisabetta published in Europa Letteraria was uh, Mary Montague's An Original Essay on Women and uh, another review of Hester Chapone's Letters of the Improvement on the Improvement of the Mind. Um, this first steps that Elisabetta took in order to publish her work in uh, this journal was of great importance because she tried to accentuate the importance of um, uh, females who would like to publish either the ar their articles or their essays in the printed press of the time. Uh, apart from a journalist, Camille Tura was a very prominent salonnière, a very important uh, figure of salons. She established and led literary salons both in, v in Venice and Vicenza. Um, of course, the most debated questions were education and then again, capital punishment and freedom of the press. I'm going to come back to the freedom of the press because uh, Elisabetta was a true uh, proponent of uh, liberty of expression. Um, Giornale Cinclopedico was the first magazine uh, that she uh, edited uh, from 1774 until 1780. Uh, this periodical has a lot of facets and it's, um, uh, and it's very interesting to observe the evolution of this periodical because it was transferred from Venice to Vicenza and uh, the title changed slightly. So from Giornale Cinclopedico, which means a cyclopedian uh, journal, it was called Nuovo Giornale, so a new journal. And the third phase, the third uh, stage of this uh, journal was finally again transferred in Venice. So basically the, um, the periodical was edited by Tura in two different cities, Venice and Vicenza. 
So the, the last stage of its evolution was Nuovo Giornale Enciclopedia d'Italia, so the new Encyclopedic Journal of Italy, which, uh, which Elisabetta Camerutura uh, edited until the end of her life. So she died in 1797, uh, which means that she was the editor of this particular journal for a very long time. Uh, apart from a journalist, she was also a journalist, an editor, uh, and a salonier. She was also the publisher of her own periodical because in uh, 1780, she um, decided to establish her own publishing house, which was called Stamperiatura. Uh, so as we can see, she was very prolific. Uh, she assumed four different roles um, in, the, in the press industry of her time. Um, one description of her journal Giglopedico, so of this journalistic venture that she undertook, um, was described by Marino Berengo, who's one of the leading scholars um, uh, studying her, her journal. He said, and I quote, under her direction, it became a combative journal that challenged the principle of authority on all fronts. From theology to law, from literature to economy, from the slavish politics of the colonial powers to the arrogance of feudal lords and big land landowners in the Veneto. Uh, so not only did she debate Rousseau's views on salons, but she also debated a, a lot of other social matters, as we can see. However, our focus here is uh, her uh, conflict with Rousseau and the way she tackled his opinions. As you probably know, uh, Rousseau wrote an en enormously influential book on education. Uh, this bo book was called Emile or on Education. It had two titles in 1762. So Kaminer, what she did is that she published uh, a review, because as I said, she, she used to publish reviews of books. Um, she published a review in her Nuovo Giornale Enciclopedico in 1785. And in this uh, particular review that she published in her journal, she attacked uh, Rousseau's female ideal, which was uh, Sophia, uh, Sophie. Uh, so uh, in this particular book, uh, Rousseau explains that Sophia is the ideal fe uh, female companion whose submissive character affirms women's intellectual and physical inferiority. Um, these, these are opinions, of course, this is not exactly the way that Rousseau writes, but, he, uh, but his treaty is um, on the fact that Emile was the leading figure and then Sophia was uh, the partner of Emile. Um, then Kaminer Tura felt the urge to criticize this model, um, although, as I said, very avant-garde for her own time. And she said, I quote, what must not be neglected in the education of women is a sufficient cultivation of the mind. Um, uh, what she used as a, an argument against Rousseau was reason. Don't forget that the 18th century is the century of reason. So um, uh, Kaminer Tura's argument against Rousseau was that if we want to be reasonable creatures, reasonable human beings, then we have to give women a chance to be reasonable and to cultivate their sensibility, but also their mind. Um, Elisabetta Kaminer Tura wrote extensively in literary salons, and uh, in 1794, uh, she again attacked Rousseau's views by saying that salon participation is not corruptive. Salon participation is not um, a problem in society. Uh, and I quote uh, her views on Italian salons. Um, her views on Italian salons are three questions, three rhetorical questions. So I quote, why in the world would a praiseworthy young woman hide herself? Might she be of the opinion humiliating to her sex that in cultivating her talent she brings dishonor to women? Must she blush for having played so useful a role and for having directed her own studies towards the good of her peers? As we can see in this publication, um, Camille Dura uses three rhetorical question to questions to attack uh, Rousseau's views uh, on the participation of women, the leading role that women played in literary salons. Uh, and of course, as we can see, she thinks that um, by expanding knowledge and uh, uh, exercising influence in the, in the private conversations of the salons, women are doing well. They were doing good to their peers. Um, she also confronted the Veneto Censorship. So uh, salon uh, culture was, as I said, thriving at this, uh, at this period of time in the, in the north of Italy. And coming there, encountered problems with censors. Um, and readers of her magazine. One of these censors was Clementi, uh, Clemente Vanetti. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I said, she never met Rousseau, but she attacked his views, and Clemente Vanetti was one more of her, 
uh, readers uh, who had pol polemical views. Um, she, uh, she, Catherine Sama is the uh, is the scholar who wrote a biography on Tuda's life, and that's why I have uh, put in parentheses Catherine Sama because it's her own translation from Italian to to English. And she's and so I quote Elisabetta. She says, "As long as the press is not free, Italy will be inferior in matters of literature." So, cul cultivation of the mind, female education, uh, participating in conversations about literature, all these three domains uh, were. Prime priorities in, in Kaminer to his writings in her uh, periodical publications. So uh, the fact that uh, Clemente Vanetti but also Ludovico Barbieri attacked her periodical means that uh, her periodical started to have influence, that her periodical started to take hold in collective consciousness. She started to have more and more readers during uh, towards the end of her life, she, her, her audience was, uh, w was more important, was growing uh, important. And uh, Ludovico Barbieri even uh, wrote an article saying uh, that there are some just and necessary reflections to make on Elisabetta Kaminer's journal Encyclopedico. So he publicly attacked her, um, her journal, saying that uh, we have to reflect on the quality of her writing. Kaminer Tura did not hold back. She didn't. She wasn't afraid of a conflict, and that's why she uh, she published another article in her own journal. Uh, and I quote: "Some will perhaps dare to believe that the just and necessary reflections on my journal are neither necessary nor just." Um, so this ironical tone um, indicates the fact that um, uh, Elisabetta really believed in. Uh, exchanging opinions with women in salons, but also if women were uh, capable of playing a prominent role in salons, they would be then able to play an important role in society. Also, uh, an important uh, information to give here is that um, as a salonier, uh, Elisabetta knew that exchanging books, translations, and manuscripts was much easier for women who participated in salons. So uh, culture, uh, cultural transfers were important in the space of the salons because uh, it, uh, it was a space that allowed women to talk to one another, even women who didn't come from the same country. For example, a lot of English women uh, held their own salons in, in the Veneto ar area. And uh, Elisabetta was well aware of the, f of the fact that she can exchange texts with her fellow attendees. And that was one more of the advantages that the salon culture could offer to the people who were privileged enough to participate in these um, private gatherings. Um, last but not least, I'm now reaching my uh, conclusions, uh, is the position of Elisabetta Caminertura, or perhaps Catherine Sama, the uh, person who, bi uh, who was the biographer of uh, Tura, said that uh, her main position was that uh, Tura didn't perceive conflict as something that we should avoid at all costs. Rather, Elisabetta perceived conflict as the natural consequence of intellectual progress. Or rather, we can say that uh, conflict is what triggers intellectual progress. And uh, this is a central idea when we read uh, the publications of Carmen Artura, we start to realize that everything she did, being a translator, being a woman of salons, being a public speaker, because she also participated in, in uh, public talks, um, she did it because she believed in intellectual progress. She believed in, in, in the capacity of women to evolve aesthetically, intellectually, and spiritually. So the outcomes now, the, the uh, results of this conflict was, uh, as, as I said again, a, a conflict of ideas, because it, it's about ideas. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, um, published a translation of the Vindication of the Rights of Women written by Mary Wollstonecraft. That was an enormously, uh, an enormously important text that was translated in, in, in French and then from French to Italian. Uh, the, issue, uh, was read the issue of Nuovo Giornale Enciclopedico was read in salons, so there is proof that um, Elisabetta's, um, Elisabetta's journal was read in three different salons. Uh, one salon that took place in Venice. Um, it was a salon held by a Greek-Italian uh, woman of salons called Isabella Tortocchi Albrizzi. And two more salons in Rome. One salon held by Maria Cucovilla and Margherita Gentili. Uh, so the, um, 
the final result, the final conclusion to this is that um, thanks to the, media the, the cultural mediation uh, of um, uh, women editors such as Elisabetta Caminatura, but also thanks to the mediation of women of salons such as Isabella, uh, Alberizzi, Maria Covila, and Marichetta Gili, uh, these women were able to focus on uh, both were both French and Italian uh, salons and uh, portray the important women that uh, the, po the important role that women could play in the uh, fructitious exchange of ideas, thus forming transnational connections both between Italy and France but also between Italy and Greece, Italy and Spain. But this is something that transcends uh, my talk today. However, uh, Salon Sociability gave these women the chance to uh, form all these transnational connections that I hopefully uh, designated here between France and Italy. Thank you for your attention. really interesting um, illustration of female networks, um, transnational, um, and um, dare I say it, female power. Um, quite interesting, really interesting. Thank you. Um, so our third speaker is uh, Maria Elisini, Elisina, sorry, Elisina, and she's uh, working at Ghent, and um, she's had a, 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 a transnational education. Um, she studied in um, the Ukraine, uh, at the Friedrich Schiller University in Germany, and then she did her uh, MA in Bruges, and uh, she's now in Ghent. Um, she's um, um, working uh, in Ghent on the We Change project um, uh, on Russian and Eastern European periodicals um, and the way their female editors um, take in uh, contemporary Western European ideas into their national context. And, and looking at um, how the notions of femininity are constructed um, throughout the 19th century. Um, she's going to be talking to us today um, about competition over readership in 19th century Russian fashion magazines. So we move uh, from the domestic to the uh, public issues of dress. I mean, it's one way women are in public, isn't it? Um, and um, she's looking at the case of the Madi magazine. Yeah, you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, in my research, I'm working on uh, Russian fashion magazines in the uh, 19th century, and. Uh, to uh, begin with my uh, case study, I will first um, give you a short introduction into the uh, way, of into the main aspects of uh, functioning of Russian fashion magazines in the second half of the 19th century uh, to give you the context for my case study. So in Russian Empire, uh, fashion magazines Uh, in the Russian Empire, uh, fashion magazines were the most popular type of uh, women's magazines, uh, uh, so magazines targeted at women. And while the first fashion magazines uh, appeared in this uh, early 18th century, the real development of the illustrated fashion press uh, took part, uh, happened uh, in the uh, second half of the 19th century. And uh, the genuine boom of uh, this genre came in the 70s. Uh, when the technological development and the social cultural uh, changes enabled uh, the shift from the from rather elitist publications to the generally popular fashion magazines that were targeted at uh, different social classes. And in my presentation, I will focus uh, exactly on this uh, decade, 70s of the 19th century. Uh, the crucial point uh, concerning the uh, Russian fashion ma magazines is the transnational character, which was uh, also the case for all the fashion magazines in Europe because uh, the fashion was uh, traditionally coming from Paris. 
but this factor was also uh, crucially important in uh, in the case of uh, of the Russian Empire because uh, for uh, Russia the Western fashion has been has always been the uh, sign of modernity and uh, the uh, affiliation of with the European uh, culture. Therefore, Western news, especially anything related to Paris, have always been the main uh, point of interest for the readership of uh, fashion magazines in the 19th century. Uh, another crucial aspect of the fashion press in uh, the Russian Empire is the active uh, participation of women in its development. But this point is uh, a little bit problematic because um, while the uh, fashion, mag uh, fashion journalism constituted the very mainstream of female journalism in, in Russia, uh, still the, uh, there's a stereotype that the uh, fashion press uh, was uh, developed uh, mostly due, uh, thanks to the efforts of two uh, big scale uh, male publishers, namely uh, Herman Hoppe and Nikolai Elevert. But this uh, stereotype ignores the fact that uh, there were dozens of women working uh, for fashion magazines editing and publishing them for, for the decades. And uh, in my presentation, I want to challenge this perspective, this uh, classic, so to say, perspective, and uh, to present the case in which, which showed that uh, it was thanks to far less known uh, people, women, uh, that uh, European fashion news and European fashion was actually found its success to, to the Russian uh, um, audience. So the uh, case I'm going to talk about today uh, is a uh, conflict that happened between uh, two, uh, two, between the publishers and editors of two most popular fashion periodicals in, uh, in the Russian Empire of in the 70s. Uh, one of them uh, is Hermann Hopp, who is on the left. You can see his portrait. Uh, he is uh, one of those two famous publishers uh, who I've mentioned before. And on the left, uh, on the right, you can see the um, picture of, of a magazine, but this one I put instead of a portrait of Sofia Rechnevskaya who is the second one, because there are no portraits, and I think it's kind of symbolical that uh, despite her big contribution, the only thing that is left after her is the magazine, and it, it has to speak for her like even without us knowing much about her herself. Uh, so uh, who, were the, who were those people? Uh, Herman Hoppe was, um, a, as I said, famous publisher of German origin. He was born in Germany and he studied publishing business in Germany and Belgium. And uh, when in the 60s he came to St. Petersburg and uh, published his own publishing house, uh, founded his publishing house, uh, he already had a lot of uh, business uh, ties with the uh, German publishing enterprises. In the classic works on Russian journalism, uh, he's presented as the one uh, who was the most influential figure in the uh, field of illustrated uh, press in Russia, and the one who basically established all the connections with the European uh, publishing houses and brought uh, the European fashion to, to Russia. In 1868, uh, he has founded his uh, own magazine called uh, Modny Svet, which in uh, English would be translated as uh, Fashionable World. And uh, that magazine was based on the German periodical uh, Modern Welt. It took a lot of information and fashion plates from there. And uh, when he founded it in 68, uh, he became a direct competitor of uh, Sofia Rechnevskaya May, uh, who at that moment for five years was already editing and publishing her own magazine with a very similar name, uh, Modny Magazine, which is a fashionable shop. Sofia May was a well-educated Russian woman of a noble origin. origin. Uh, she was married to a, a famous Russian poet, Lev May. And in 1862, she has founded her own fashion magazine. And for 20 years, she was uh, writing all the um, articles related to fashion and culture for this, uh, even though she was also engaging a lot of famous poets and writers uh, of the time to contribute to the literary section of it. Uh, in, uh, in 1881, uh, she had to sell the magazine uh, after 20 years because of her age. She sold it to another publisher, uh, Valeria Turba, who in two years sold it to Herman Hoppe. So in 15 years, uh, after the 15 years of the competition, Herman Hoppe became uh, the owner of both magazines, uh, which he united under the title Modern Svet and Modern Magazine. Uh, and that made uh, him uh, a monopolist on the field of the Russian fashion press, at least for a few years in the 80s. The uh, conf um, 
the conflict uh, that I will talk about uh, happened in 1879, so just a few years before two magazines were merged. And uh, here on this picture, you can see uh, the uh, magazine, Modny magazine by Sofia Kniewska May on the left, and uh, Modny Svet by Hermann Hoppe on the right. And you might you might notice that uh, the fashion plates on the title pages, on the front pages, are just the same. And uh, it's part just one of uh, many example of examples of such a coincidence. For example, this, you can also see two different magazines uh, with the same fashion plate on them. Another one, and another one, and there are many of them. Uh, and the core thing about uh, these uh, fashion plates are not only that they are the same in two magazines, competing magazines, but also the, uh, that the origin of, those, uh, of this fashion plate is uh, a French magazine, Parisian magazine, uh, Revue de la Motte. Uh, but the ways in which uh, these fashion plates took oh, occurred on the pages on the pages of those magazines are very different and that basically constitute the essence of the conflict which I'm going to present now. Uh, in January 1879 uh, in St. Petersburg in newspapers uh, there was a note uh, from the Municipal Judicial Chronicle uh, which was describing the case of a uh, uh, complaint of a private complaint of uh, Sofia Kniewska May against Hermann Hoppe uh, that she addressed to the St. Petersburg uh, city court, and uh, here you can see the extract uh, from that note. Uh, Sophie Rechnevska May uh, has exclusive property rights of the engravings of the French magazine Revue de la Motte, based on the letter from the editorial office of this magazine and the convention between Russia and France on the literary and artistic property. Many of those engravings published in Rechnevska Modne magazine have also occurred in the pages of its competitor Modne Svet, published by Hermann Hoppe. From this note, we can see that uh, Hermann Hoppe was basically reprinting the, in his magazine the engravings uh, for which uh, Sofia Rechemska May had exclusive rights in Russia. Uh, and the problem was that uh, after the uh, court, uh, eventually court has, uh, despite all the signs of counterfeiting, the court has uh, eventually uh, acquitted Hermann Hoppe by claiming that the, those engravings were not uh, the artistic property, but just a mere technical skill, which didn't allow the court to consider it as a case of uh, counterfeiting. Uh, to be honest, from uh, the sources which I had, uh, this, uh, the real uh, reason for this decision was not really clear or well explained, doesn't seem well explained to me, but uh, what is more important for us, what is more interesting for us, is to uh, take a look at the reaction of uh, Sofia Rechnevska May. Uh, here you can see uh, a screenshot of the uh, magazine, uh, of her magazine, Modern Magazine uh, of 1879, in of February, uh, uh, the 1st of February, which uh, it was the following issue, the issue that followed the uh, court's decision, and uh, she dedicated uh, one page and a half to uh, publishing her own article, which explained uh, her position and in which she was defending her um, her arguments uh, against Hermann Hoppe, who was acquitted. I suggest uh, you to take a look at the most prominent points, uh, since they contain a lot of interesting information that go goes beyond the this case itself and shed us some light on other aspects of functioning of uh, Russian fashion press. So the, first of all, it, uh, this case uh, sheds light on the transnational connections which were established by Sofia Knetska May. Uh, here we have uh, two small quotes. Uh, a two-year-long correspondence between editorial offices of Revue de la Motte and Modne Magazine clearly demonstrate uh, our close professional relations. Fashion plates of Modne Magazine were printed in Paris from cliché of a magazine Revue de la Motte completely on their paper and were shipped to St. Petersburg every second week. Uh, what is interesting here that uh, Revue de la Motte was part of the only f French magazine uh, which was uh, uh, collaborating with uh, Modne magazine, and uh, this course uh, gives us uh, an explanation of how Sofia Knevska May was uh, establishing this connection. So she was um, she was also working with uh, La Mode Industrie, Le Mode de Paris, La Saison, Le Mode Parisienne, uh, Revue de la Mode, so the most prominent uh, French fashion magazines. And this case uh, shows that she was. Uh, developing the uh, official professional contacts uh, with this uh, editorial offices and making the official contracts. So she was contributing to the transnational network of fashion periodicals in an official way. Uh, another thing is that uh, the next point is the 
how these two publishers were dealing with the property rights issue. Uh, so here we have another quote on this uh, thing. A publisher of Revue de la Mode wanted to recognize my exclusive pro property rights of all the fashion plays that, was, that he was publishing in my magazine and in one of his letters asked me to protect our common rights from counterfeiters. Uh, as a reaction to this uh, demand, uh, Sofit Nevsky May has addressed the Imperial uh, Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg, and uh, as a result, she acquired uh, its official approval of the property rights on the old fashioned plates published by Revue de la Motte and reprinted in her own magazine. And this was supposed to be, uh, th uh, this action was supposed to defend her and this. Uh, fashion plates from counterf uh, counterfeiting. But Herman Hoppe found very inventive way of bypassing this. And um, from the uh, article of Sofia Knevsky May, we found out that uh, Herman Hoppe was actually reprinting the same fashion plates, but he was taking them not from the French original magazine as uh, Sofia Knevsky May was doing, but he was taking them from the Spanish edition of this French magazine. And in her uh, article, she explains why. Oh, what an idea is to subscribe from uh, Spain a magazine originally published in Paris. Apparently, it was made in order to avoid the responsibility, since there is no convention on the literary property between Russia and Spain. Uh, and this apparently was the one of the reasons why Hopper was uh, acquitted, because legally there was no way to uh, to accept this case as counterfeiting, even despite the obvious reason that it was this case. And what is even more interesting is the uh, is that uh, in the end of her article, Sofia Knetka May explains, uh, provides an explanation for the motivation that was uh, read behind the Hoppe's actions. Uh, why did Mr. Hoppe need to reprint the fashion plays from Modern Magazine while he had so many of his own ones? This is very clear. Modern Magazine was putting in its pages Parisian fashion, and uh, that was its specialization. While in modern Svet, the fashion plates were printed from a German magazine, Modern Way. This gave the former an advantage over the latter, and uh, that was what never left Mr. Hoppe in peace. And the overemphasis is original, so she emphasized the Parisian and German origin of the uh, content from of two periodicals. Uh, so from, from here, from this quote, we can see that uh, Parisian authority, Parisian prestige won, uh, for the success of the fashion magazine on the Russian market was uh, very evident, uh, and uh, she also added that uh, Mr. Hoppe ha could have taken the uh, French fashion plates from other magazines, but in this case he wouldn't harm her prestige and her uh, reputation on the market as a unique source of these fashion plates in Russia. Uh, since I, uh, I didn't find any uh, similar article written by uh, Herman Hoppe on this case, I don't want uh, this information to look like uh, a biased version of the situation, so I suggest you to go back to the broader context and to look, uh, to check if uh, this explanation provided by uh, Sofia Knevsky May is justified. Uh, as uh, the we have to look at the, uh, at the competition between these two magazines, and uh, it was all about finding the niche on the market uh, to distinguish itself uh, from the uh, from the competitors, and I suggest to compare the uh, programs of these two magazines uh, in the years of the conflict to see uh, what which points did they did emphasize and what we can extract from that. So, Modern Magazine by Sofia Knevska May, uh, the uh, qu quote from the 1877. Throughout the year, uh, you subscribers will receive 24 technical issues with marvelous illustrations of the selected Parisian fashions and accessories. All play fashion plates of modern magazine are made by the best Parisian artists and are printed in Paris. Emphasis is original as well. So uh, Paris's Paris affiliation with Paris is proudly announced here and uh, basically having Parisian uh, content as a source, a, a Parisian magazine as a source of contact, content meant being solid and trustworthy as a fashion magazine in Russia. Paris was the key uh, token of credibility of a fashion magazine and it spoke for itself. Uh, the situation is a little bit more tricky with Modern Svet, published by Hermann Hoppe. Here we can uh, see what he has written. Uh, Modern Svet is a Russian magazine. Uh, the suprema supremacy of Paris is so strong that fighting against it would be pointless. However, triggering the interest to the national Russian co uh, costume, promoting the national style in all the surrounding of the woman, that is how we understand a Russian fashion magazine. Mm, uh, nothing is said on the affiliation of the magazine with uh, German 
magazines, uh, even despite the fact that uh, modern set completely depended on the uh, fashion plates and the information taken from uh, German magazine, modern Welt and probably also the others. Uh, German content was cheaper and it was also more accessible for Hermann Hoppe, who was of German origin and had German connections, but it didn't have prestige on the Russian market. So uh, in, in marketing terms, uh, it was more, it was wider and more, uh, made more sense to talk about the Russianness of the magazine as the ID of the periodical than instead of drawing attention to the German uh, source of the content. And mm, as I already said, uh, a few years after this, conf uh, after this conflict, uh, these two magazines were uh, merged into one uh, under the ruling of um, Hermann Hoppe. And I suggest to take a look at how at the program of the new magazine and to check how the uh, program of the periodical changed when uh, uh, how the content in how the program of the Hoppe's periodical changed when Modern Magazine became a part of it. Uh, so uh, the program, uh, the call for subscription for the year 1885. Today, Modern Svet Magazine is truly the best and the most comprehensive Russian magazine on fashion. Direct relations of the editorial office with the best Parisian fashion enterprises, contact with the best French ma uh, fashion magazines, such as Revue de la Mode, La Mode de la Saison, as well as direct relationship with the needlework enterprises in Vienna and Berlin, allows us to inform our subscribers on everything that is new and the best in the field of fashion. Uh, so here we can see that uh, when the Hoppe became uh, the owner of the Modern Magazine, which had uh, affiliation with the par uh, Parisian magazines, uh, he immediately put it on the top of his program, that, uh, which has never been the case with the German uh, magazines and the German connections. In this way, we can say that Rytnevsky's argument uh, on the uh, prestige of the Parisian fashion and the uh, uneasy attitude of Hermann Hoppe to having such a competitor who has connections which, t which he didn't have, really uh, were the main source of motivation for him to reprint some fashion plates which were published in his competitor's magazine, even though he had plenty of information uh, from his own sources. And uh, to conclude, to put it in the broader context, I want to say that um, I mean, the modern Svet and modern magazine uh, existed uh, until the last years of the existence of the uh, Russian Empire, until the 1815. Uh, and uh, all the credits for its enormous uh, success and longevity uh, eventually went to Hermann Hoppe, despite the fact that uh, the biggest asset of this magazine uh, were actually those direct connections with French magazines which were established by Sofia Rykniewska May, whose name is almost unknown in the uh, studies, in the scholarship of uh, Russian fashion journalism. And this case proved that the success of the big scale publishers uh, in bringing European fashion to Europe was often dependent on the previous achievements and uh, uh, achievements of the less known women editors and publishers who did all the scrupulous work of uh, both on the level of editing the magazines and also establishing the con uh, contacts and uh, signing the contracts with uh, European fashion uh, magazines. So, our fourth paper, and the third of this uh, Ghent team, uh, is Charlotte Dea. I hope that's the right pronunciation. Um, and um, she specializes in German language periodicals. Um, she's um, done her first work, a master's degree in English and German uh, from Ghent, and she's also done uh, another MA uh, from uh, on comparative modern literature, uh, which specialized in gender studies. Uh, in women authors and research on emotions. Um, she then went on to study at um, the University of Hamburg in Germany. So um, she's going to talk to us now on um, women editors, editorial conflict and transnational correspondence, an analysis of the feminist periodical 
documented their Frauen uh, based in Germany between 1899 and 1902. Um, yes, uh, um, good morning everyone and thank you to Professor Brake as well for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, so for today, I will talk indeed about women editors, uh, personal conflicts and transnational networks, and I will do so by analyzing the German periodical uh, Documente der Frauen, which was published in 1899 until 1902. Um, as said, I am also a member of the WeChange team, and I work on German language periodicals, but I have a special uh, Viennese case for you today. Uh, because Austria was very interesting at the time. It was a cosmopolitan city. So think of uh, Viennese coffee houses, of Die Wiener Moderne. Cultural exchange was very much flourishing at this time. And Austria was also a bit seen as the little brother or sister of Germany. Uh, they were very much influenced uh, by Germany at the time due to the mutual language, of course. Uh, so taking this into account, we will dive right in. Um, I have taken the theme of this conference quite literally. And I will look at conflict as sort of a, a transnational concept, and more specifically, um, personal conflict, which is intrinsically part of the transnational networks created between women editors, periodicals, but also, uh, and we often forget this, their letters, obituaries, and legal documents. So I'm focusing on what I call personal conflict, so conflict between women editors and feminists that are represented, shaped, and ultimately part of modes of textual exchange. Paradoxically and interestingly, conflict is not just part, um, an essential part of what happens behind the scenes, but it is also cult cultivated as essential to be performed within the periodical. So there's this kind of paradox which gets played out. Um, and in the case study that uh, I will present for you today, this is clearly seen in Documente der Frauen. Because you have uh, this conflict between the women editors, the co-editorship, uh, which they very much try to hide. And then the kind of performed conflict uh, that fits the editorial, so the kind of conflict they actually wanted to cultivate. Um, yes, so I will look at Documente der Frauen, but also a little bit at Neues Frauenleben, which uh, came after Documente der Frauen. Both of these periodicals were edited by Auguste Pickard, and for Documente she got help from Rosa Mayrede, Marie Lang, and to a certain extent also uh, the Swedish-Finnish Mainki Friberg. So, um, August Fickert, she was an important feminist, journalist, and teacher in Vienna to such an extent that she became president of the Austrian Women's Association. So, a feminist movement which advocated for women's rights and represented mostly the, the liberal middle class. So, evidently, this organization needed its own organ, not only to publish on the political issues, but also to disseminate international news on women's social conditions and women's movements. So when Fickert started her periodical, um, she had to look for other women to co-edit this periodical. She needed a strong, active network. Um, and she had the obvious choice of um, Rosa Mayrede, who had a large artistic network uh, among her, for example, Tina Blau, or even more famous, Lou Andrea Salome. Um, and then we have Marie Lang, who was also very educated, but had a 
quite a small network, not that many letters um, are left as well. So this co-editorship was quite a smart move. This way they had a larger network and of course they could um, kind of share the financial responsibilities. Uh, you can already see a bit that Rosa Marie connected quite well to Auguste Fricket when Marie Lang was already a bit um, on the side of the project. Um, so to start the periodical then, um, it's actually, uh, it starts already with um, Auguste Fricket trying to get uh, her other editors in the same circle. And you get this, uh, she asks other women editors for collaboration as well. Uh, in Germany, you have Anita Augsburg, a women editor of um, Die Frauenrechtlerin, and she bluntly remarks that she does not have the time to collaborate with Auguste Fickett. She has other obligations. And the famous journalist at the time, Emilia Mattia, uh, ridicules Fickett, saying she will be a laughingstock because she wants too many things at once that will be a priori rejected. Now, one of the exceptions is one of Fickett's best friends, Mikey Friberg. Uh, the Finnish uh, Swedish editor of Mutid and later uh, Narsten Arni, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And we see Fickett um, already uh, mentioning her friendship to uh, Augusta Fickett. Congratulations to you and all the women's rights activists on your own periodical. How impressive to start a bi-monthly straight away. I have to be satisfied with only my monthly magazine. It is my pleasure to exchange my magazine for yours. So Fickett clearly uh, chooses her camps. Mikey Friber Friberg is on board, uh, Anita Augsburg and Emilia Mattia are not. Um, Later, she will uh, talk about Mikey Friberg as unsere hochgeschätzte Mitarbeiterin, our very valued colleague. So that the interrelation between women editors resulted into unwanted conflict, insecurity, and sometimes even a rupture of a relation is due to the role of often conflicting personalities. In Auguste Fickett's case specifically, her persona was widely discussed. When she died on the, uh, June in June 1910, a wide range of periodicals and magazines published an obituary to commemorate the fearless woman, the Unerschrockene, behind the Austrian women's movement and the editor of two important feminist periodicals. The obituaries unanimously describe Fickett as a headstrong individual for whom it was impossible to adjust to any kind of organization fighting fanatically to the cause without making any concessions. And the Evangelische Frauenzeitung um, goes as far as to call Fickett ruthless. It becomes clear then that Fickett had very liberal views. Uh, she was quite adamantly fighting for the cause, which had mostly to do with better social conditions. And my reader confirms this image in her own obituary about Fickett, but offers an additional insight in what Fickett truly felt behind the persona. And this persona clashed enormously with other people, unfortunately for Marie Lang also with her. And uh, my reader, continues by saying in her obituary, and I quote, Ficker thought she was the standard of her sex. She mixed up her own personality with that of the average person. Um, Marie Lang was part of the Theosophical Society, so she had a very religious take on feminism. Her collaboration with Ficker was rooted in a deep spiritual admiration for Ficker rather than any long-standing conviction or personally felt disadvantage that actually characterized feminism. Uh, and this was bound to clash with Fickett and to a lesser extent with my reader. Because um, Fickett was very keen on working with facts, with legal documents, with the truth, 
for instance, uh, look at what the, the name of the periodical, Documente de Fram, documents she wants to prove, and not the spiritual um, wish wash that Marie Lang approved of. Um, so according to my reader, the failed partnership with Marie Lang was very painful for Figgert. And she quotes, for idealists, the clash with reality is always a painful crisis. For Auguste Figgert, this was espe especially the case because she was completely and utterly disappointed by the one she loved most. A personal friendship together with the collaborative work went to ruins. And she goes on, moreover, she was of such a competitive nature with an uncompromising will that she was not suited for the commonality of working which cannot possibly exist without a drop of compliancy. Uh, in such a way that Fikert became more and more isolated and distanced herself from everyone who failed to meet her opinions. Then from Friberg's letters, we learn how Fickert had become more and more specific, uh, suspicious of other people and what they actually wanted. Um, so she continues, you have concluded from my letter that I invite you out of mere selfish reasons so they will write and talk about us a lot, but this is not at all the case. So you get this conflict of the personal and um, the uh, political. And in a later letter she states, please understand me because I can assure you I don't want you here out of mere uh, political reasons. I just want the pleasure of traveling and chatting with you. So you can see how Fickett becomes more and more uh, suspicious. So this raises new questions. Since the personal and the political were so very much interwoven, not just with Marie Lang, but then also a little bit with Freeberg. How much of this becomes apparent in the periodical? And if it does, then in what way and how did it affect editorial decisions Fickett had to face after her fallout with Lang and her increasing mistrust? The consequences for Documenta, interestingly, are not very much visible uh, for the readership. As Lang states in her first issue of the second year of publication, the layout and program of the periodical stay the same. Both of them will continue to contribute to the magazine, which I will further edit in the same way. She's not completely wrong. So she, nothing really changed about the content or layout of the periodical now that Marie Lang was in charge, but she did lie about further contribution by Fickett. The fact that she kept the periodical going was not to the likes of Fickett, who dropped out after one year. So she decided to start her own periodical, Neues Frauenleben. This time, however, she did not make the same mistake and she embarked on her editorial journey alone, fully adjusted to her own standards. As president of the Austrian Women's Association, she was able to gain enough votes to install Neues Frauenleben as a new platform of the Women's Association. And this meant, of course, the financial and social death of Documenta since it lost most of its sub subscribers to Neues Frauenleben. My reader then continued as part of the editorial board uh, of another periodical that you can see right there, Frauenrundschau, and Marie Lang uh, gave up altogether and just disappeared out of public life. Uh, now, paradoxically then, Fickert is surprisingly open to critical letters regarding her articles and was surprisingly open to conflict in every sense. Especially in her new periodical, Neues Frauenleben, you can see her tolerance and even joy to spark debate concerning the women's question. And another friend of her, Else Lüder, who was um, uh, a German woman editor, um, she wrote an, um, an editorial letter which was published in Neues Frauenleben saying, and I quote, 
The most important article in the January issue of your Value magazine contains critical opinions about the German women's movement. According to me, it is extremely difficult to evaluate the conditions of a different country from an outsider's perspective. That is why this article contains a few inaccurate representations. Therefore, I would like to use your kind permission to express my opinions concerning some of the points in the above mentioned article. The gentle, encouraging words and the mutual interest, and this is very interesting, uh, for the factual information to Fickett uh, were very important. Interestingly then, Fickett uses a footnote to lure the reader in and to guide them towards the proper attitude to, uh, to this article, to Elsa Luda saying, this is okay, this kind of conflict fits my magazine. And Fickett says, um, we give space to this fresh controversy and we look forward to any other factual responses and discussions concerning this article. The important word here being factual, which was precisely what Fickett and Lang failed to agree upon, the importance of fact and truth. And if you have a quick look at the editorial, um, you'll see that it become became clear already in Document der Frauen that this is where Fickett was going. Uh, and she addresses the, the reader. Uh, I'm just reading out the red uh, letters. You want facts, saying to the reader, you want facts, you want to know about real situations. You want to see and perceive this, the women's question, through your own eyes. So facts, not the spiritual. And this is something completely different from what Lang wanted, who was more conservative and more <coughs> spiritual in nature. The conflicting sh situation with Elsa Luda is therefore merely uh, a kind of staged, performed conflict, carefully edited to fit in the editorial program of Documenta, which is emphasized by the footnote. And Fickett pushes this through in Neues Frauenleben, as I already indicated, with um, one of her famous slogans, um, durch Erkenntnis zu Freiheit und Glück. So inside wisdom, facts will give us freedom and happiness. Um, I've come to the conclusion um, of my talk for today. And this case study ends with a very disillusioned Augusta, a but actually with a very strong-minded, financially uh, healthy periodical which continues to exist for another 60, even seven years under the editorial of her brother Emile Fickard and two feminists who were also part of the association, Leopoldina Kurka and Christina Tuaya. Uh, so thank you for your attention and I'm very open to uh, questions after our talk. Hi, my name is Alberto Gabriel. Um, I work on the global dissemination of print culture uh, in the 19th century. Great panel, wonderful um, evolution of uh, print culture and the industry in several locations and several periods, very, very interesting. So I do have a, a question first uh, for uh, Elisabetta, no, sorry, for, um, where is the name, Christina. <laughs> and uh, uh, since you are in such a privileged position to have uh, covered so many different national contexts, I was really curious to hear um, from your perspective, it's such a rare um, kind of perspective to have for most of us, how do you see transnationalism and you know what kind of trends, uh, what kind of evolutions, what are the uh, tracks so far that's um, fascinating specifically in your topic? And I refer also to circulation, material culture, whatever you want to go into. And also uh, I have a question uh, for um, uh, Maria. Very, very interesting. Uh, gave us a fantastic view of 
what was really this uh, commercial war between uh, the kind of global ambitions of the <coughs> French print industry and the German one towards Russia, which is very fascinating. But Hoppe, uh, in the later part of the 19th century, but Hoppe takes us to this kind of previous German history that was kind of covered or sketched or kind of referenced very briefly in your talk. And I'm just curious to know, since Germany was such a patchwork of industry and states and regulations, just where he was from, um, just to understand uh, what wh where he was from originally, where he trained, and the uh, kind of Belgium training was also fascinating because throughout the 19th century, uh, book publishers and printers, and we know that we're publishing books and periodicals at the same time, had this kind of um, habit of being transnational. So it's not just the latter part of the 19th century. You have uh, uh, Scottish uh, you know, publishers who are trained in Dublin, but they're active in Australia, so it's kind of uh, very so ongoing. Provenance, yeah, yeah. provenance. It's really That's right, the yeah. two interesting general questions. Let's, let's try them. Uh, so one, what do we, what is being defined as transnationalism, and two, uh, provenance of a publisher, um, perhaps across Europe. But okay, thanks. So, answer. Thank <laughs> you very much for your interesting question. Uh, one trend that I have uh, traced while studying uh, women editors in the southern European countries and the Mediterranean countries is that there is a specific journalistic genre that emerges in Spain. It's called Crónica del, del Salón. Uh, you have this Salón Chronicle, so women editors who also participate in Salón life and they're writing representations of salons, they're publishing them in their articles, and in this way, they turn their the salon attendees into members of the editorial boards. So uh, a lot of the times, both in Spain and in Italy, members of the editorial board of a magazine are also attendees of a salon. And this is a tendency that I spotted uh, in, in, in all Mediterranean countries. Second, uh, a second uh, similarity that I have traced is transla are translations. A lot of women editors translate the works of one another and also disseminate these works by saying that this is a famous author in Greece. Please read her in Spanish because she was th your time. Um, so if I am to, to, to define the concept of transnationalism, it's based on these two similarities, so translations and networks and salons that help these women to travel and also to um, perform network um, networks through text. So textu textual analysis will help us trace these connections because uh, some of these women knew each other, so they saw each other, they traveled to Mediterranean countries and they, they met in person, and some other women didn't have the chance to meet one another. And so that's transnationalism from a more idealistic perspective where these women were connected by the mind, they were connected by their writings and not, not by their talks in person. Uh, I would say more, but maybe yeah. I pass over have to your time, colleague. So yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, thank you for your question as well. And uh, Hermann Hoppe uh, was from Westphalia in Germany. He was born there and he studied in Germany and Belgium and in England as well. Uh, I'm not working on this case so far, so I don't really know the precise details, but um, he was invited to, to Russia t by another German who was also working there and had a publishing house. And uh, so he started to work as a hired worker and then he decided to establish his own publishing house and what I've just noticed uh, in general the ties of Russia with Germany is very strong and uh, the impact of German uh, publishing industry is very strong and it's uh, apparently the, the most uh, the strongest one because French was prestigious English was sometimes uh, occurring but the English language is not that popular in Russia uh, and Germany was really the, the main source, it was the closest of the main source of all the innovations, technological innovations as well. And what I also noticed about the, so there are plenty of uh, workers from, from Germany. And what I've noticed that uh, those publishers uh, who came from, uh, from abroad, they, they really had very strong commercial interests. So they never, uh, and it also impacted the way they shaped the field. So they had a technical potential, they had uh, Western training, they had uh, financial resources, and they also uh, had very strong commercial goals. So they didn't have any emotional affiliation with the country. So it also, I think, it impacted the way uh, they just spread the factual uh, novelties from the West. Yep. Thank you. Um, second question. Uh, there's one in the back next to Andrew. If you tell us who you are, it'd be good. <laughs> hey, I'm Stefano Garzoni from Pisa. From Pisa. I have a question uh, to Miss Maria Aliesina. 
uh, this, um, it was very interesting, uh, your paper, uh, and uh, I think uh, the history of fashion, uh, of fashion magazines in Russia is uh, quite interesting. It, it was history beginning from the 18th century. And then, for example, we have a very, uh, very good um, magazines in, the in, in, in Pushkin, Hera, for example, Galatea, published by Simon Reich. Um, I think, I don't know <laughs> if, you are <laughs> if you agree, that there is a, di a, a difference between uh, uh, Mr. Goffe uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, Sofia, so Sofia Palanskaya Rutnievska uh, Rutnievska Rimaik, as you prefer. Uh, the, the problem is that um, for me, I think that uh, Sofia May was, uh, first of all, she was a writer a translator, a, a, a woman of culture. And uh, on the other side, Hope was uh, a man <laughs> of money, <laughs> so, uh, enterprise. Uh, for example, then he, he, he published Simirna uh, Illustratia and other, and other, uh, and other magazines that, that have a, a very important uh, role in, 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 the, in the economic life or Painting in, in Russia at the, at the end of, 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 uh, of the century. Uh, do you agree with, with this? Uh, th then it's interesting that, for example, uh, in Modny, uh, in, uh, in the journal uh, printed, uh, were published uh, uh, texts by Nikrasov, uh, by Maikov, uh, May. May was a, a good poet, and, and uh, he, he, his. Uh, uh, his, po his, lyrics, his, po his, his poems were put in music by Mussorgsky, for example. So, yes, <laughs> perhaps you could sum up the question before you start, yeah. Uh, thank you a lot for this question, because first of all, thank you for such a knowledge, such a deep knowledge of, the, of this field, because uh, I assume there are not that many people who know so precisely. And uh, the, que the question basically was uh, about the d if I agree, uh, if uh, there was a big difference in the attitude and uh, motivation of Hoppe and Sofia Rutnevska May. Indeed, uh, actually, I wanted to cover it in my presentation. I just didn't have time. That I, that's why I took this uh, period, the 70s, because it was uh, a moment when the uh, fashion press started to shift from the uh, elitist and content-based, very solid uh, magazines with a very solid literary pieces, a very decent uh, content, to more commercial, cheaper, and also more flexible. It, it doesn't necessarily need a, mean a bad thing. It's just another type of fashion magazine. And uh, this 70, this conflict was uh, was a sign of this uh, of this shift from more content-based uh, approach to more marketing-based approach. And uh, uh, the Sofia May indeed she was very uh, she was a selling hostess. She was a writer herself. She was she has very intense uh, uh, ties with the int intellectual uh, circles in Russia. And uh, Hoppe was oriented rather, uh, targeted rather at uh, merchant women, so uh, a bit lower social classes. And of course, it impacted the uh, the content of the periodical, the format of the periodical. But the thing was that um, elitist uh, periodical, they, they didn't, especially because the editor and publisher was a woman, of course, she didn't. And she started to publish this periodical out of financial need. So, so she didn't acquire uh, the financial resources, the technical training, the uh, all the novelties of the 80s and 70s, which Hoppe had and which he brought from, from the 80s. So I think it was a nice merge of technological advancement, but at the same time, the content and the quality of the magazine was developed by in the 60s by editors like her, because she really added the literary component to it and very uh, reflective component, so to say. It was, and then it was combined with a uh, marketing approach, and in the end of the century, we had another type of it's good to hear, I must say, um, you know, a, uh, an explanation of the popular press that um, is positive and, <laughs> you know, and is, is capable of uh, incorporating, um, you know, intellect with the commercial methods and new technologies and so on. I think we need to think a lot more about the positive elements of the popular press, myself, um, coming from a culture of periodicals which has so, you know, privileged the... Um, you know, the reviews and, you know, the, the high culture reviews and magazines. We need to look beyond that and see, you know, why millions of people are reading, you know, uh, and, and the very interesting content, right, that we find there. Okay, good. Another question? Yes, back there. 
tell us who you are. Hello, um, my name is Rio. I'm from uh, University of Liverpool, uh, and I look at little modernist magazines. Uh, I have a question for Charlotte. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was particularly interested in, you spoke about the performative aspects of the personal conflict. Uh, and I wondered, do you perceive in your work any, um, any aspects where that is colored by the gender of the editors? Uh, you know, w women were, were constantly painted with this idea that we're too emotional, we can't keep our emotions separate from our business. Um, so is, is there a risk for these women editors in the performativity of that conflict? Is it different to how they experience conflict with, with their male colleagues? Um, or is, is there a way in which they can kind of manipulate that to their advantage? Yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think the idea of performance is very interesting when looking at these periodicals. Um, I actually work on emotion studies myself as well, and the idea of how we can trace emotions through networks, and I kind of treated the idea of conflict kind of as an, as an emotion itself, how it's rooted in the personal or the more semi-private sphere of those letters and then being staged in the periodical. Um, and if we kind of look at, um, I, for me it's kind of surprising, well not surprising, but those women were very adamant in fighting for the fact and establishing the truth rather than being uh, linked to any kind of uh, emotional um, uh, mindset as such. Uh, you have the stereotype of the feminist as the angry woman, and these women were quite angry. You can see their frustration throughout the periodical. And uh, the idea of those footnotes, do you see how polite they converse with each other, how very much they try to not be that uh, kind of angry woman itself, but kind of making it seem as based by fact. And I didn't have the time to kind of go into this now, but you get a lot of, um, of these women, for example, basing their uh, articles on statistics, uh, on um, uh, struggling for the, the English word, the enquête, like uh, they, they really asked other women's opinion and made it as rational as possible, as factual as possible. And still you can kind of see that uh, frustration with uh, the popular press, unfortunately, as well. Um, so yes, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We have time for one more short question, if there is any. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I'm uh, David from uh, Nancy and Augsburg, and I have a question for uh, Professor Neurosi. Um, First of all, thank you for this very interesting um, contribution. Um, you mentioned that uh, newspapers, uh, journals wanted to uh, instruct and to improve ladies. You mentioned also the French example, uh, which was very popular. And I'm interested in, are there some narrative strategies or how do uh, this uh, journals try to improve the ladies. Yes, here. If I have, uh, sorry, if I have understood it rightly, uh, you are interested in uh, exploring how, which were the strategies to improve um the, the to improve ladies education their manners their well um in, in very in very short words um first of all what mrs krakensol for instance does is underlying you know facts 
and I found there is a sort of uh, trend going on from the very beginning of the century from uh, the female tattler onwards to uh, these uh, periodicals which were published uh, all over Europe in the at the end of the of the nine of the nineteenth and the beginning of the twentieth century. Well, facts, examples, um, examples which of course are uh, fake examples, but they are presented as examples. Uh, I mean, true stories. Uh, there is this realistic strain which is already taking, you know, its place in the, uh, in the periodicals of the, the beginning of a century and uh, of, a long se of a long 18th century and onward, which, of course, brings us, takes us to the new literary genre the novel. So short stories uh, and uh, which um, are good examples to teach you, reader, how to reform your manners with a very, um, how can I say, with a very keen uh, sight on what is happening in that precise moment. So there is this looking for a, a realistic register, which is, you know, what really they aim to do, at least this Mrs. Crackenthorpe. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'd like to thank the audience for a, a group of really interesting questions, I thought. You know, I mean, there is a challenge in um, a group that's looking across cultures, you know, and is speaking from different cultural positions. And I thought, you know, the questions really, um, you know, kind of uh, took that all in and made uh, sense to everybody in the room, really, and, and was helpful, I think, in terms of the papers, too. So thank you all for participating in a, what I thought was a situation, uh, a, a panel that really cohered. Thanks a lot. <laughs>